Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting of April the 11th, 2023. 
As we begin this morning, in just a few moments, I'm going to call on Commissioner Gomez Cordero uh, to introduce uh, the pastor who will bring the invocation. After that, uh, we are going to have the Pledge of Allegiance, and Commissioner, if you will be so kind as to lead us in the Pledge of, Ame uh, of Allegiance. Uh, after that, uh, this morning, we do have a number of proclamations that are going to be presented. Uh, our communications division manager, uh, Dr. Jeff Williamson, will read the proclamations recognizing Fair Housing Month, Earth Day, Arbor Day, and the Tommy Towson Day uh, here within Orange County. And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments. But as we begin today, I do also want to recognize some students who have joined us in the audience uh, from the uh, Mi Familia Volta Youth Leadership Program. Uh, this is a group of high school students uh, that uh, we uh, have seen uh, involved in various community-based uh, volunteer initiatives. They come from Timber Creek High School. Uh, where are those from Timber Creek? Uh, okay, we're going to give you a shout out if you don't mind. Okay. And the other group is from Boone High School, if you will stand at this time. All right. Uh, we are always glad to see our young people uh, getting involved in, in their community activities. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Commissioner Gomez Cordero at this time for the introduction of our uh, invocator today. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, commissioners and all staff. Um, today, I will have the honor to present our pastor, Elias Hernandez. He is originally from Bayamón, Puerto Rico. He started his professional career at the age of 19, working as the store manager at a Dunkin' Donuts in San Juan, Puerto Rico. He met Vanessa Ortiz, his wife, for 28 years. They have three beautiful children, Ashley, Vanelli, and Josue. He then embarked to, on his professional career as a commercial banker for the main banking institution in Puerto Rico, where he held the position of senior commercial re relationship officer. He served honorably in the United States Air Force. He earned a bachelor's of science from the University of Phoenix, a master's of science from Lee University, and he is currently pursuing his doctorate degree in theology. Pastor Hernandez and his wife are the pastors at John 316 Church of God in Lake Nona. They have been missionaries for more than 25 years, making the impact with social and evangelistic work in the Caribbean, Central, and South America. He is an entrepreneur and owner with his wife of Vanessa Coffee Shop restaurant located in Lake Nona with operations in Puerto Rico and Florida, having more than 100 employees. Thank you for that. He is currently a member of the board directors of the theological department of the University of Puerto Rico. He also is the director, together with his wife, Vanessa, of the evangelism and mission program of the Church of God in the Hispanic Southeast region. In November 2022, they launched the franchise for their company in Florida, hoping to reach 30 stores in the next five years and provide employment to more than 500 people. Pastor Eliezer is grateful to God for moving him and his family to Center Florida in 2011 to contribute to the spiritual, commercial development and growth of this beautiful city. Thank you, Pastor Eliezer, for honoring us with your invocation today. Bendiciones. And Pastor, after the uh, pledge, I'm going to actually come down and uh, take a photograph with you, but please come to yes. the mic at this point. Please. And then his son will be translating his prayer in English. Thank you. Buenos días a todos y cada uno de ustedes. Good morning to each and every one of you. En especial al alcalde y de estos distinguidos comisionados. Especially the mayor and these commissioners. Y agradezco grandemente por la invitación. And I greatly thank you guys for the invitation. Oramos. We pray. Señor Todopoderoso y Padre Nuestro. Lord Almighty, our Father. Santificado sea tu nombre. Hallowed be your name. Te damos gracias por este nuevo día. We give you thanks for this new day. Donde te exaltamos y te bendecimos. Where we exalt you and bless you. 
tu santo y bendito nombre. Your holy and blessed name. Te presentamos en esta hora. We present to you in this hour. Esta honorable actividad de la mañana de hoy. This honorable activity of this morning. Bendecimos el alcalde y a todos y cada uno de los comisionados. We bless the mayor and every commissioner in this room. Te pido, mi Dios, I ask you, my God, que los bendiga grandemente. That you bless them greatly. Con sobreabundante inteligencia emocional. With overabundant emotional intelligence. Y sobre todo espiritual inteligencia. And overall spiritual intelligence. Para que puedan continuar trabajando. So that they may keep doing. Con excelencia para el condado. Their job with excellency for this county. Todo en un ambiente. All in an atmosphere de altura y respeto of highness and respect y dirigido por tu espíritu directed by your spirit para que continúen so that they may continue realizando una excelente labor doing this excellent labor como han hecho hasta ahora as they have until now bendice su casa bless their homes bendice su familia bless their families y de igual manera and in the same way bendice grandemente bless greatly a cada honorable comisionado que se encuentra aquí each and every honorable commissioner en este maravilloso condado in this amazing county llénalos de tu favor fill them with your favor llénalos de tu gracia fill them with your grace para que todos continúen so that they may continue realizando realizing de manera efectiva y eficiente in an effective and efficient way la encomienda que tú has entregado the labor that you have given them a cada uno de ellos each and every one of them y que todos and that, they, and that everybody en el condado de Orange in Orange County reconozcamos Recognize que tú también that you eres el Dios are the God de quien nos gobiernan. Those who govern us. Todo esto All this, lo declaramos we declar we en el dulce nombre de Jesús. In the sweet name of Jesus. Amén. Amén. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Amen. Buenos días. Gracias. Gracias por la bendición. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Mayor. As the Mayor said, we indeed do have four proclamations today. The first one is for Fair Housing Month. And the proclamation reads, Whereas April 11th, 2023 marks the 55th anniversary of Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, known as the Civil Rights Fair Act Housing, and prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin and disability, as well as ensures fair practice in the sale, rental, funding, and f financing of property. And whereas the Fair Housing Act of 1988 added new rights, remedies, and monetary penalties, and strengthened its enforcement procedures. And whereas Orange County acknowledges the importance of this act by establishing expanded rights under County Code Chapter 22. And whereas each year, the month of April, is dedicated to reaffirming our commitment to equality of opportunity and eliminating discrimination in the housing industry. And whereas Orange County affirms that every resident has the right to live with dignity in any area they desire without fear of discrimination and supports state and federal protections against discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. And whereas Orange County is committed to highlighting the fair housing law by continuing to address discrimination in our community, supporting housing programs that will educate the public about the right to equal housing opportunities and partnership efforts with other organizations to help assure every resident has their rights to fair housing. Now, therefore, Jerry O. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim April as Fair Housing Month in Orange County. Done and ordered this 11th day of April 2023, signed by the mayor 
and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Receiving this proclamation and delivering a few brief comments is Mitchell Glasser, Manager of the Housing and Community Development Division for Orange County Government. Mr. Glasser. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Demings and Orange County Board of County Commissioners for reaffirming the importance of the Fair Housing Act and committing to continued efforts to eliminate housing discrimination in Orange County. Every county resident should have the same opportunity to live with dignity in the home they can afford and choose to live in. For this reason, it is a good opportunity to recognize our community partners. Um, without the support of the real estate community, the housing industry partners, and community activists, act, advocates, we would not be able to do this ourselves. I would like to uh, um, use this opportunity to recognize one of our key partners who uh, who's has, has assisted Orange County in educating our citizens about their housing rights and equal ho housing opportunities. With me today is attorney Jeff Hussey from the Community Legal Services of Mid Florida, Director of Litigation. And I would like to ask him to join me in accepting this proclamation. Also with me today is new staff members that we have hired, Kayla Martin and Anna Scott, who will be assisting us with our fair housing outreach and education in partnership with the new Office of Tenant Services. Everybody join me. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. New team members, welcome. Attorney, thank you so much for your service. Our next proclamation is for Earth Day. And the proclamation reads, whereas Orange County is leading by example by protecting natural lands, conserving water usage through integrated best management practices and installing floating and ground-mounted solar arrays at several Orange County utilities' water, wastewater, and solid waste facilities. And whereas in 2022, Orange County became a certified LEED Gold community by the U.S. Green Building Council. And whereas the combination of Central Florida's verdant landscapes, diverse habitats, and warm weather give residents a chance to enjoy nature by walking, kayaking, observing wildlife, horseback riding, or just relaxing in the county's green place preserves and conservation areas. And whereas in 2021, the Orange County Board of County Commissioners committed to the ambitious goal of acquiring an additional 23,000 acres of environmentally sensitive lands by 2030, and whereas important and iconic wildlife species like woodpeckers, Sherman's fox squirrels, and sandhill cranes survive and thrive in Orange County thanks to local conservation efforts, and whereas we are all caretakers of our planet, and we all have an obligation to conserve national resources, plant trees, and support innovative collaborative efforts to protect and nurture the environment. Now, therefore, Jerry L. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim Saturday, April 22nd, 2023, as Earth Day in Orange County, and call upon our community to participate in Earth Day events and join together as one voice in declaring that the Earth matters and to spend time outdoors appreciating and enjoying nature. Done in order this 11th day of April, 2023, signed by the mayor and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Receiving the proclamation and bringing us a few brief comments is Renee Parker, the Assistant Manager of Orange County's Environmental Protection Division. Ms. Parker. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Comptroller Diamond. Earth Day is a very special time for all of us to reflect on how our actions impact our planet. For me, it's also a time to give thanks for having the opportunity to work for a such a great division and dedicated team at Orange County Environmental Protection Division. On behalf of my colleagues, I'm honored to accept this proclamation. I hope you all join us later on this month as we uh, celebrate Earth Day at one of our properties that was recently purchased as part of this board's actions to expand the county's Green Place program. 
With your continued support, we're helping to make and preserve environmentally sensitive lands and making our community a stronger and more resilient place to live. Thank you. I do have uh, David Jones, our manager of EPD, and Liz Johnson, our assistant manager of EPD. Come on, Denise. Come on. <laughs> all right, thank you, Ms. Parker, Mr. Jones, and all those in our EPD division for the great work that you do. Our next proclamation is for Arbor Day. And the proclamation reads, whereas for the past 16 years, Orange County continues to receive recognition as a Tree City USA community by the National Arbor Day Foundation, and whereas in 2022, approximately 1,162 Florida-friendly trees, including native species, were provided to homeowners through the University of Florida's Extension's Adopt-a-Tree program, and over 2,500 trees were planted on county land, parks, and facilities, and whereas Orange County has set a goal of doubling the environmentally sensitive lands by acquiring 23,000 additional acres by 2030, providing long-term benefits to wildlife, health, and recreation, and whereas Orange County continues to partner with the United States Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, and Florida Trail Association to extend the Florida National Scenic Trail into to national natural lands and parks in an effort to connect residents and visitors to recreation opportunities throughout the state. And whereas on this 151st anniversary of National Arbor Day, Orange County commemorates the mission of Arbor Day by hosting tree planting events, protecting green spaces on county properties, and enhancing wildlife habitats. Now, therefore, Jerry O. Dibbings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim Friday, April 28th, 2023 as Arbor Day in Orange County and call upon residents to plant trees and support efforts to protect and preserve the environment for the well-being of current and future generations. Signed by the mayor and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, receiving the proclamation and providing a few brief comments is Kevin Cam, manager of Orange County's Cooperative Extension. Mr. Cam. Well, good morning, Mayor. Commissioners, um, staff, thank you for continuing to acknowledge Arbor Day. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't provide any education while I'm up here, just being that we do education. But while we know the benefits, the scientific benefits of trees, as one tree produces 260 pounds of oxygen each year, and one acre of trees removes 2.6 tons of carbon dioxide each year, Shade trees can also make buildings 20 degrees cooler in the summer. Now, those are the scientific facts, but we all know that trees bring a lot of emotional impacts to us as well. Growing up, smelling the smells from trees, uh, sometimes getting uh, sick from pollen from the trees, but it's okay. <laughs> the adventures from our youth, being able to climb up and, you know, using our imagination that we're tackling the world while we're climbing through the trees. And then also planting a tree and watching it grow and visiting it year after year after year. There's so many benefits from trees. It is apparent that Orange County cares about our trees, our environment, and also is ensuring that our future gets to appreciate what we've appreciated so far in our lives. We did celebrate, we are celebrating the 16th year of the Tree City recognition from the Arbor Day Foundation, and many hands took uh, took care to bring some information and get us to, to get that recognition again this year too. And lastly, a, a, a nice little plug, on the 29th, the day after Arbor Day that we're celebrating here in Orange County, come to our office because we have an adopt a tree program that Orange County residents can take two trees back and be able to plant and celebrate with their family. So thank you very much and that also for the photo opportunity 
since this is a community effort and we have so many uh, other divisions and departments that have uh, that really are part of this Arbor Day and planting trees, I'd like to invite all of you up as well as our future, the youth. Um, so thank you. One more, Frank, one more. There's a flag. round of applause. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, students. Thank you, Mayor. Our last but uh, certainly not least proclamation is for Thomas Tommy Townsend Day. As a football fan, this is a good, a good fun one for me to read. Even though I'm a Cleveland Browns fan, he beat my team last year. It's all right. It happens. Whereas Thomas Tommy Townsend graduated from William R. Boone High School in 2015. <laughs> and following his senior, his senior season, he was named first team All-American, All-State, All-Central Florida, and was the first alumnus from William R. Boone High School to play for a winning Super Bowl team. That deserves large applause. Whereas Thomas, Thomas Tommy Townsend attended the University of Florida where he finished his college football career with 4,162 yards on 93 punts, as well as setting the University of Florida's record for the most yards by a punter in a single game. Whereas the fourth game of his rookie season in 2020, Thomas Tommy Townsend had two punts that went for 65 year, yards against the New England Patriots. That is hard to do. He finished the game with an average of 60.8 yards, a Kansas City Chiefs franchise record for punt average in a single game. And whereas during Thomas Tommy Townsend's rookie season, he was named to the Pro Football Writers Association's all-rookie team. And whereas in his second year of professional football, Thomas Tommy Townsend was named AFC Special Teams Player of the Week, and in 2022 was named AFC Special Teams Player of the Month, and AFC Special Teams Player of the Week again. And whereas Thomas Tommy Townsend finished the 2022 season with 53 punts for 2,672 net, net yards for a 50.42 average. And he earned a Pro Bowl and First Team All-Pro honors for the 2022 season. And whereas in Super Bowl 57, Thomas Tommy Townsend punted twice for 98 yards in the Kansas City Chiefs 38-35 victory over the Philadelphia Eagles. Now therefore, Jerry L. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim Tuesday, April 11th, 2023, as Tommy Townsend Day in Orange County and proudly recognizes the Super Bowl champion for his professional football career achievements and his sincere love for the game done and ordered this 11th day of April, 2023. Yeah. Signed by Mayor Demings and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Receiving the proclamation as he did a Super Bowl trophy, Tommy Townsend. <laughs> Well,
Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Demings, uh, Commissioner Uribe, and uh, the entire county commission um, for the proclamation uh, of Tommy Townsend Day and having me and my family here. Um, you know, anything hometown related is uh, is very important to me, and uh, I take a lot of pride in where I come from. So, uh, so it was a great honor for me to uh, represent Boone High School, the city of Orlando, and in, uh, in Orange County on uh, one of the world's biggest stages. Uh, and of course, winning the Super Bowl is one of uh, one of one of my greatest accomplishments, and uh, I'm so happy to be here sharing it uh, with you all. Since, um, since yeah, I, I, I my dad mentions it all the time about how. Uh, you know, Orlando people has, have a sense of entitlement on, uh, on me and other uh, people that come from here. And, um, you know, I, I completely agree just because the, uh, the community is so tight and, um, and yeah, just such a, such a tight-knit community. So, uh, so I appreciate all of you uh, very much. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I can't thank my, my yeah, friends and family and the, uh, the entire commission for uh, – I can't thank you all enough for, uh, for having me out here. And um, I would actually like to uh, present a couple footballs to um, – Mayor Demings of the commission and uh, also uh, Commissioner Uribe, uh, our personal uh, commissioner. But um, yeah, we also uh, awesome. there's also some uh, some con it's just yeah a couple signed footballs and uh, there's also some confetti from uh, the Super Bowl awesome. uh, at the uh, at the bottom. So thank you so much. I appreciate you all and uh, happy Tommy Townsend Day. <laughs> Uh, Frank, before you go, and Tommy, if you wouldn't mind taking a picture with the Boone High School students who are here. Uh, Boone High School students, why don't you come and take a quick picture with Tommy, if you don't mind. Since he is an alumnus. I know we've got a full agenda, so come quickly, please. Students, thank you very much. I 
think she's left. Oh, she's there. She's at Hold on. Hold on, one more. Yeah, in the middle. Slow the <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Then it will look taller than you, and that doesn't look good. <laughs> see, see, the good idea is to make them a senior commissioner. <laughs> you have to wait, you have to wait that one. Well, everyone, that's a great morning when we have a Super Bowl player. We have Super Bowl students in, in our audience and, and all of you. And also, it's a great day because it is Commissioner Christine Moore's birthday. <laughs> all right, Commissioner. We will sing happy birthday to you, but I don't know if we sing very well uh, or not. All right. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Christine. Happy birthday to you. How old are you? 41, you, did you say? 49. Okay, 49. We'll take that one too. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, at this time, we will move forward with our main agenda for today. Um, with that, it is time for a public comment. And I'd like to invite comments from members of the public regarding topics of interest or concern that are within uh, this board's authority. However, there are certain matters which are not appropriate for public discussion during the public comment period. These matters include pending procurement or land use issues or concerns that should properly be brought to another board rather than this board. And also, we will, of course, solicit public input during each public hearing scheduled for this afternoon. And with that, Mr. Boyce, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard at this time? Yes, sir. We have seven members of the public that wish to be heard this morning. Uh, the, a few housekeeping items as we begin. Uh, we'll call each of you three at a time, and if you'll line up on that uh, side wall, as I would mention your name, please approach the podium. We'll ask you to state your name and address for the record, and then we'll give you two minutes. All right, so we'll begin. Our first speaker this morning is Michelle de Florimont, followed by Cynthia Harris, followed by Maddie Lynch. Ms. Michelle de Florimont. All right, we'll move to Cynthia Harris. Ms. Cynthia Harris, if you will approach the podium, state your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Cynthia Harris, 12 Channing Avenue, Orlando, 32811. 
On March 2nd, I submitted a records request to Planning and Environmental and Development Service Department. To date, I have not received any acknowledgement that my request was received. Neither did I receive any notification or request from the department requesting additional information from me in order to comply with the release of information, which is very disturbing. Additionally, it took me over a month to gain a meeting with my representative from my district. The meeting was held yesterday with Commissioner Scott, and instead of conducting a constituent meeting to discuss the topics of community concerns, the commissioner took it upon itself to utilize the time to launch an attack against me. Commissioner Scott used our meeting time to personally insult and accuse me, one of his constituents, of disseminating via FedEx a derogatory written statement regarding himself. He infringed upon the meeting time to personally accuse me and expound on a meritless and bogus civil suit. Commissioner Scott accused me of slander libel against him in the presence of his two aides who were taking notes. The 2022 election is over, and at the end of the day, I am a constituent. I felt set up, violated, ambushed, and reprimanded without due process. He attempted to scold me as though I worked for him an Orange County employee instead of him understanding that he is employed by the residents of Orange County. His actions were self-motivated with the appearance that he only agreed to meet with me to throw an election in my face versus addressing the issues of his constituent. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Uh, I'm going to, regarding the uh, issue with reference to records requests, uh, I'm going to look to the county administrator if we can have someone uh, follow up with her on that issue. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. All right, with that, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Maddie Lynch, followed by Ann Lott, followed by Janae Buford Johnson. Maddie Lynch. We'll just ask that you line up uh, along that side wall as we call your name so that we can move efficiently and be uh, respectful of your time. Matty Lynch? No. Uh, in lot? No. Nope. <laughs> Janae Buford? Thank you. All right. Please state your name and address for the record, ma'am. Janae Buford Johnson, 229 Ronnie Circle, Orlando, Florida, 32811. Thank you. Um, I live in Orla Vista. My home was destroyed in Hurricane Ian. And it is apparent that, you know, we still have debris outside of our homes, a lot of people. There's a lot of things that still aren't being addressed in our area. And I'm here today because I want to know what's going on in our community to help resolve our issues, because there still are a lot of issues. Right now, I'm still homeless. My daughter and I were picked up in my car, on the top of our car, and I have no car. I have no home. I have no memories of my family, my memorabilia, my children everything, my grandchildren, my home, I've lived in my home. We've had my home since 93. And today, I'm homeless still. And I'm fighting to get back to my house. So I'm waiting to see what's going to happen with our county to do something for our community. Not just our community, but as a whole, as who we are. Thank you. Um, sorry to hear about your, your troubles there. Um, there's probably a lot of details that we'll need to uh, get from you in order to provide assistance to you appropriately. Um, and uh, we, do have, uh, uh, we do have a staff member that's going to reach out to you and get all your contact information and see if we can follow up and get into uh, more of the details. Um, OK. Um, Ms. Devon Williams is, is coming forward there. All right, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Trine Kiros, followed by Angela Emerson. Uh, and that's it for this morning. I'm sorry, Trini Kiros. Apologies for mispronouncing your name, ma'am. You'll state your name and address for the record, and you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's very difficult to I'm come sorry. here. I'm sorry. Yes. Trini Quiroz, 2000 Hillcrest, Orlando. Thank you, ma'am. It's very painful and very difficult to come here and see all these beautiful ceremonies. God bless everybody. 
But when you are a people's advocate, a community advocate, and you get daily the suffering and the pain that this, the speaker before me brought about, there is no way to rejoice in anything. I was sitting there and the letters and the lyrics of Lou Armstrong is a wonderful world. While the Arbor people and the, the whatever proclamations were given, that was all good. We think about the treats, we think about the bears, we think about the lakes. What about human beings? It's very difficult for someone like me has dedicated her life to serve those who have less than she ever knew to come meetings like this where the power and the money, this is one of the richest counties in the state of Florida. Let's do something for our people. People are homeless, hungry. People are evicted. People are jobless. People are paid minimal wages. Let's do something for the 1,400,000 people that live in Orange County. I hope one day I'll come here and be glad and happy and say, housing is doing its job. Employment is doing its job. Homelessness is doing its job. But you know, I get calls from 7 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. I don't blow my trumpet to no one. I call and I say, can we please help this person? No one should be living like that. So please, commissioners, please, mayor. And sometimes I speak louder because when you sit in there, we cannot hear what you're saying. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kiros, uh, for your comments. Uh, do we have any other speakers? Yes, sir. Uh, Angela Emerson is our final speaker for this morning. Can I give a handout to each of the commissioners? If you clerk, just clerk. give it to the clerk, if you don't mind. Okay. Sorry, I guess they have to keep a copy so one won't get get a copy I didn't know it okay. good morning my name is Angela Emerson 14729 Baltusville Drive Orlando Florida when a governmental agency grants a permit for development that impacts our environment they are the only entity that has the authority to oversee the conditions of that permit are met if they do not it has negative ramifications on the environment and Orange County taxpaying residents I have given each of you a document that is a modification to a Master Lakes stormwater permit for my community of Eastwood. It reads as follows. The operation phase of this permit will not become effective until a Florida professional engineer certifies the system. And uh, the permit receives a issued by the district. Uh, construction, alteration, and maintenance are completed according to the permit. Within 30 days after the completion of the construction of this system, a portion of the system, the permittee must submit certified or one set of plans to reflect how the system was constructed. I'll go back here. The permit holder never completed this step and the permit remains in the construction phase 22 years after development. Meanwhile, the stormwater system on the golf course is aging, compounded by not receiving proper maintenance. These lakes help to constitute a direct discharge into the Econ River. Leaders of Eastwood met with Ms. Susan Davis of St. John's and our commissioner of October of 2022. They confirmed this information with proof they had sent non-compliance letters to the developer in the summer of 2019. We were assured this matter would be taken care of. Now they are not responding to phone calls or emails. And meanwhile, our community continues to shell legal fees to fight against the golf course owner who seeks to develop the land in our community. Does the mayor have any concern for our environment and flood mitigation for Orange County residents? We need your assistance in this matter. I'm here to reiterate my concerns that Orange County is not putting clean water and the protection of our waterways as a priority when planning and allowing development projects. Just this last week, Eastwood discovered a large pipe outfall structure that discharges reclaimed water directly into our community, and this discharge was not disclosed to our HOA by either the Florida Department of Environmental Thank Protection you, or St. John's. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, uh, Ms. Emerson, that had a lot to it there. Um, 
Our, our um, public works and stormwater, I'm mean, sorry, public works and uh, utilities have been meeting with her, and uh, Joe Conkle is in the back as well, Mayor, but um, they have an ongoing rapport at this point, but Joe Conkle can follow up uh, and continue the discussion as well as uh, I know there's been some matters with utilities as well. And uh, I know that we've had many conversations with Ms. Emerson over time, and I know uh, Commissioner Gomez Cadero has been working with yeah. the various constituents out there in the East Ward area. So, Commissioner Gomez Cadero, would you like to make any comments? Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Ms. Emerson, for being here. And I want to say, just to correct, that she said that um, they are not responding to the phone. It doesn't mean me. I already had a meeting with her this week as well. So, I guess she, she means the, you know, the water um, people, the saltwater water management also. But... We have been in touch with her, and she's very diligent with this. So thank you, Mr. Angela. All right. Uh, the next speaker, please. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Marjorie Holt. Ms. Marjorie Holt. If you'll state your name and address for the record, ma'am, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes, good morning. I'm Marge Holt, and I'm with the Sierra Club Central Florida Group. I reside at 8502 Elvron Avenue, Orlando, Florida, and I'm pleased to be able to comment today on the Wetland Conservation Areas Ordinance, and on the whole, um, I believe that it's a good step forward in uh, improving our wetland uh, regulations and saving some of our wetlands. So. But I do have some comments, and I noticed, um, I do support this special new protection for Shingle Creek and the St. John's River and the increased upland buffers and other requirements uh, to be defined, which I'm sure that'll come later. But within the stakeholder feedback um, during the regulatory framework, I would say it's easier to, to comment on some of the things that you know, I don't support and that would be for no cumulative wetland impact review. I believe that's really an important assessment. And to um, recommend similar upland buffers at the state minimum of 15 feet average and 25 feet. I mean, I recommend that we stay with our 25 and 50, minimum 25 in most of our areas. And then I noticed, I, as I was going through the Orange Code, and um, I noticed that the Orange County School Board is exempt from state mitigation on the small isolated <laughs> wetlands, but at the same time, it's a challenge for EPD to get those requests. So I would support a process in place that makes sure that those school board impacts get to EPD so they can assess those. So uh, there's more comments, but in the interest of time, I thank you and uh, look forward to this moving forward. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments uh, this morning. Uh, we will move to the next speaker, please. That concludes our public comment period for this morning. Thank you. All right, to all members of the public who came to speak this morning, uh, thank you for providing the feedback that you have. We'll follow up with you accordingly. We're going to move forward on our agenda at this time. We'll move to the consent agenda. I'm going to ask the county administrator, Mr. Byron Brooks, to present the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor Demings. have just one item to pull from the consent agenda. That one item is uh, G2, under Planning, Environmental, and Development Services, G2. Uh, it's related to consumer protection uh, ordinance that the board will hear this afternoon. So it's pulled from the consent agenda to be heard con or considered concurrently this afternoon with public hearing I-17. And with that, Mayor, uh, staff presents the remainder of the consent agenda for board consideration. All right. Uh, with that, uh, is there a motion for approval? So moved, your reading. Second, more. We have a motion uh, by Commissioner Uribe, second by Commissioner Moore. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move then to the next item on our agenda for this morning. Mayor, I uh, didn't know if you wanted to recognize uh, two of your uh, 
tease that the board just confirmed? Oh, yes. Well, we have two uh, members who were appointed uh, this morning uh, on the agenda. Let me go to... So on that first page, uh, looking forward to Ms. Vinnie Thomas and Tim Armstrong. Okay. Uh, is uh, Ms. Thomas present? Okay. There's this. This is going to be uh, coming aboard with our Community and Family Services Department. Uh, a wealth of um, experience from multiple different local governments uh, across the country. Uh, welcome to uh, become part of our team. All right. Thank you. All right. And uh, the second person that we have is Tim Armstrong. Tim Armstrong. Tim, Tim uh, is being promoted to Deputy Director of Utilities. Tim has been with us a long time now. So we'll be hearing from both of them quite a bit here during the board meeting. So all right. Thank you all for being present today. All right. Then we'll move to the next item on uh, discussion agenda. Ms. Uh, Carrie Mathis is going to frame the next item, uh, A1, a procurement item. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Our first item today begins on page 807 of your agenda. The Procurement Committee has evaluated proposals for secondary general liability tort legal counsel services. I am requesting board selection of one firm and an alternate. Commissioner Moore was assigned to the Procurement Committee. All right. Uh, Commissioner Moore, uh, would you like to offer a motion? I would. I move for the selection of Fisher and Rushmer PA 420 points with Walker Revels Greenwicher PLLC at 395 points as the alternate. Second, Wilson. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. With that, we'll move to the next item. And Ms. Mathis, you're recognized. Thank you. This item begins on page 813 of your agenda. The Procurement Committee has evaluated proposals for cost estimating, scheduling, and project management services for the Orange County Convention Center. I am requesting board selections of three firms and an alternate. And Commissioner Moore was also assigned to this Procurement Committee. Okay. okay. If no questions by members of the board, Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yes, I move for the selection of Cost Management Inc. doing business as CMI at 461.47 points, PMA Consultants LLC at 404.76 points, and Procon Consulting LLC at 330 points with Krauss Manning Inc. DBA as KMI International at 324.37 points is the alternate. Second, you read me. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. All right, the motion passes and it is unanimous. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Mathis. We're going to move to the next item on our agenda for this morning, which is a uh, board work session. I'm going to ask Mr. Tim Hole from our environmental programs uh, and protection division to come forward to make a presentation. Thank you and good morning, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Today uh, we're going to cover a work session on Chapter 15, Article 10, our Wetland Conservation Areas Ordinance, uh, and talk about policy. I will uh, cover a background this morning, and then I'll ask our vendor, Dr. Claudia Listopad, to come up, and she's going to cover some key recommendations. And then I'll come back up at the end and wrap up with a summary and next steps. So just to go over uh, where we've been, what we've been working on, and what we've been uh, uh, doing over the last almost 18 months now. In December of 2021, you'll recall we did a work session on our current wetland permitting and review processes, which really set the stage, of course, for what we're doing now and where current code might have some shortcomings. And then in fall of winter and winter last year, we did the wetland tours where we brought the board out and looked at some real world wetland scenarios and talked about potential policy changes. 
And then in December last year, we did a work session on the first of two technical studies. That one was the regulatory framework study. And some of the findings that came out of that were that our ordinance is outdated and it's out of sync with policy and procedures around the state. Uh, numerous regulations and policies at the state and, and other counties may be of benefit for consideration in our own new code. And then during some interviews with staff consultants and NGOs, important feedback and ideas for consideration for the update were received. I'm going to um, dive a little bit into the details of exactly what that feedback was because as you'll see, there are themes here that uh, we've carried through and are going to be discussed in the recommendations today. So just to touch on some of them, uh, at the county interview level, they uh, utilize exemptions or a general permit um, for those activities that have minimal impact. Um, several of them have a one-step review process, so they don't, they don't have a CAD. They just have the CAI permit. Uh, staff issue most of their permits. They do require re reasonable use and avoidance minimization. They use UMAM, as do we, for functional assessment. Uh, some of them have buffers that are 25 to 50 feet wide, wide, but there are some that were greater for specific system types. And then lastly, most of them have, have additional requirements for their environmental sensitive zones uh, and for wetland connectivity. Uh, we also interviewed um, up to 10 consulting firms uh, that represent the development community. And some of the suggestions they gave were to implement exemptions or streamline processes Consolidate the CAD and CAI, remove the wetland classification system altogether, allow for or prioritize urban infill, uh, do not implement a cumulative wetland impact review criteria, and they recommend similar upland buffers as a state, which is a minimum 15 foot average of 25 feet width, and then adopt additional upland buffers to protect rare habitat. And then wrapping up in the last uh, interview, section were the NGOs, so these were environmental advocacy organizations. They said that all wetlands should be equally protected, allow staff to authorize most applications, require avoidance minimization, strengthen listed plant species protections, don't assume state permitting authority, um, allow minimal amendments to existing conservation easements, and adopt additional upland buffers. So in addition to the regulatory framework study, there was also a work session provided uh, in January on the state of the wetland study. And this was a, really a landmark study of its kind that um, we're not aware has been done at any point for any county in Florida, at least within the last 20 years. And some of the findings there were approximately 5.6% loss of wetland acreage countywide from 1990 to 2020, excluding the Lake Apopka North Shore Restoration Area. Uh, most of the loss was to the system type of wet prairies at 37%, but also mixed wetland forested hardwood systems at 19%. It identified a moderate decline in contiguity and increased fragmentation for freshwater marshes and wet prairies, um, but most wetland types showed increases in fragmentation. Uh, additionally, many of the on-site mitigation sites showed functional losses after 10 years. These were highest for shrub systems, followed by freshwater marsh and mixed hardwood. Exotic vegetation is often observed in the edges of those uh, mitigation conservation easement systems, in the initial 25 feet especially. And then uh, a higher level of assessment is needed when considering preserving and planting upland buffers. The next engagement we had was internally in February. We had a focus group or workshop, if you will, with <coughs> county staff to talk about some of the recommendations that the vendor had made um, during the technical studies. And so we shopped these initial ideas with staff to make sure uh, we had consensus, uh, at least conceptually. And um, so that was very fruitful as well. Our goals of today's work session are to present you with these initial draft recommendations and we would like to receive info, input from the board on the concepts and the initial direction of the ordinance update. After today, over the next three, four months, We'll be discussing that board direction with the stakeholder groups and integrating the feedback, refining the recommendations, and uh, uh, developing a draft ordinance through the summer um, to bring back to the board in the fall. So at this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Claudia Listopad uh, with Applied Ecology, Inc. She's our vendor that's been assisting us with this effort, and she's going to go over the key recommendations this morning. 
Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm thrilled to be here. So I want to provide a highlight of the key recommendations, starting with um, just uh, highlighting that these are really draft, conceptual, and we have a lot of uh, fine-tuning to do. So we just want to get initial feedback. So based on our studies, both the state of the wetlands and the regulatory framework, we definitely saw some themes that showed up in common. And we wanted to make sure that we could address some of these with our recommendations. So these are kind of divided here into five topics. Um, based at the top row is current code, some of the issues that we're seeing with the current code. And the bottom row is some of the objectives that we wanted to address with these initial recommendations. So for example, the current code, we saw that we currently have, for most part, one per permitting process for all types of impacts, regardless of very small impacts or very large. So an objective that we had in mind was let's define a process that is different for minor, routinely approved, or even <laughs> beneficial uh, impacts, for example, for a wetland restoration process, as a separate process from the other types of impacts. Another current code theme that showed up was that wetland function was not being represented by the classification system that's used. So what the objective is of this recommendation, this changes in the code, will be to protect the most valuable, in terms of function, wetland systems regardless of size. Uh, the current code has lack of predictability, and we heard this time and time again. So we want to make sure that as we revise the code, it's predictable, it has a predictable outcome that helps with planning and review from both sides, both county side and the public side. Um, the current code does not stipulate any upland buffer requirements. We certainly want to have better wetland protection to make sure that we have specified upland buffers uh, as a key part of the code. And finally, the current code does not really incentivize in-county mitigation. I know that's been a topic brought up several times, so an objective is obviously let's try to incentivize in-county mitigation. With that in mind, this is the major recommendation topics we're going to touch on today. First big topic is the idea of this tiered permitting approach where you have two types of permits, the notice general permits and the standard permits. Second topic is the additional special protection areas that we are considering. Third topic, establishing upland buffers. And finally, last topic, mitigation approach. Starting with the initial topic. The tiered permitting approach includes two types of permits. Notice general permits versus the standard permitting route. So what is a notice general permit? Uh, Army Corps State and several municipalities have developed general permits. So this is not anything new. It's been around. Uh, usually used only for very small wetland impacts, applicable to specific types of activities. So it's not for all types of activities. And criteria are attached and must be met by activity type. So the idea is the activity uh, causes minimal individual and community impacts and requires, it does require an application submittal, requires a review and approval. So on your right-hand side, you have an example of an Army Corps Notice General Permit application. It's a relatively simple application that you have to fill out. So what's the benefit of having a Notice General Permit? Well, first of all, is a very clear, transparent process. It enhances uh, the process, builds trust with customers. For example, we have developed a, a sample form here on the right-hand side that would be for a notice general permit for Orange County, for example, for a fence, for installing a fence. Um, and you can see it's a couple pages. It has check boxes. You know, does this uh, criteria is met? Yes, no. So it's a very simple, clear, transparent application process. It captures common activities that are typically approved already by the county, uh, and it facilitates reduction of time and costs to customers and staff. The simplified application process using this type of checklist should reduce those requests for additional information, RAIs that are very time consumptive for both staff and customers. Mm -hmm. And very importantly, it allows your staff to be focusing in on projects with more significant impact on natural resources. That's where we want them to spend their effort and evaluation at the time. A little bit additional information, NGPs. 
So the idea of NGP is that in some cases uh, can provide additional streamlined review and combining the CAD and CAI, you saw that was a the theme there. Um, this is specifically could be the case for single family homes, notice general permits. Instead of having two different site visits, that could be done as a combination of one. <coughs> it's important to notice that again, there's very specific criteria would have to be met certain types of activity, I'll go over that, and also there'll be certain modifiers that will eliminate the ability of someone to request a notice general permit. On the bottom, it's your graph, it's basically an example of the typical workflow of notice general permit in case, for example, of a small impact on a single family home, where you basically have an application that um, would require only one site inspection where you look at wetland limits and you look at functional scoring simultaneously. So what are some activities we're currently looking at? Again, these are all draft ideas here uh, to get feedback. So on the left hand side, some activities we see all the time. Again, fill for single family home sites for small impacts only, that's asterisk is very important. Fill for non-single family projects would be a different category. Again, they'll have different cr criteria it's for small impacts. Filling isolated artificial surface water ponds, filling upland cut drainage ditch, some maintenance activities, urban redevelopment infill, installing fences, things we see all the time. On your right hand side, there are actually activities typically <coughs> beneficial. Uh, for example, exotic plant removal, we certainly want to do that, but those do have wetland impacts, you still have to do a permit. We want to motivate, encourage those. Wetland enhancement, obviously another activity that does have an impact that is beneficial. Water quality enhancement, utility with temporary impacts. Intake or outfall structures, we all worry about flooding, so those are important. Certified affordable housing projects. So those are some ideas of, of specific notice general permits would have associated criteria for each of those. So I wanted to bring in some examples just for visualization purposes of what one of those would look like. For example, a fence activity permit. So you can see here, you might have a, left, a wetland here on your left hand side and you have a fence that well, the owner wants to install around the property for property limits and it's just barely touching the wetland. In this case, you'd have special requirements for the type of fence, you couldn't uh, limit wildlife, you couldn't limit impede um, flow of water and so forth. So you can see these very open fences would be allowed. That would be a type of NGP that would exist. Another type of NGP I mentioned was a single family home for very small impacts and I want to show you two examples of what would be an NGP and what would not be classified as an NGP for comparison. On this side, again this is just animation, it's very simple. You have a traditional house with um, a big circular driveway all sitting on top of a wetland. You have about half of the property, half of the lot is actually upland where it's white. So. Because you have all this impact on here on the left hand side, that would actually not be allowed as an NGP. The right hand side, however, you now have a much smaller impact because the house, instead of having a circular driveway, has a direct driveway. It's using the upland area and has a very minimal impact and it's a second story so that it has less footprint. So that's the difference. NGP would not be allowed, would not fit the criteria of a single family home side on the left hand side. But on the right hand side, it would. Just is just conceptual, uh, providing a, an idea of what these would look like. Finally, an example that you probably see quite a lot and hear a lot is upland cut ditches. So you have a ditch here. The, the beige color is upland. And obviously the wetland is the vegetated, more beautiful part, green. You have a ditch through a wetland. So on the top, you have an impact to a wetland, so that does not qualify for NGP, but on the bottom, it would, because it's an upland cut ditch. It was historically an upland. So it just gives you an example of what NGP could look like. Moving on to the ty second type of permitting, what we call the standard permits. The idea of the standard permits, it, it would require, obviously, additional analysis and evaluation process. There are three types of standard permitting levels that we're currently considering. Level one through level three. So as you go up levels, you're talking and looking at higher, um, larger impact size, higher functioning wetlands, more oversight, more review, more requirements associated with those. 
For example, the special uh, level one, smaller impact for activities that don't qualify for a notice general permit, they might even have tried to go for an NGP and didn't fit all the criteria, for example, for a single family home. So they'll go to a standard permitting level one. They are required to do avoidance and, uh, and minimization uh, and mitigation as well. Level two for larger wetland impacts, depending on the wetland function, additional level of review, and level three for the largest impacts, highest functional wetlands. Very important for level three, it requires BCC oversight. Um, the level determination is based on a combination of factors. The functional score, so how well it functions, and that's based on UMAM as uh, approved and required by the state. The wetland acres to be impacted, not the size of the wetland themselves, but what you're impacting. The type of impact activity is important. What are you impacting for? And finally, a list of other factors. We call those modifiers that I'll go through in a little bit. So I know this is a lot to take in if you've never seen this, but this is an initial idea of what a matrix will look like from level one to level three. So level one is in green, level two is in yellow, level three is in red. As you can see, and those numbers are still yet to be defined, just to give you a conceptual idea of those. The smaller wetland impacts, in this case, we put them under two acres, are under the level one. As you start moving up, you start moving up levels. Uh, as you have higher functioning wetlands, you might move those up. For example, a level two might be something like eight, um, a functional score from eight to 10, which is a high functioning wetland. Um, even if it's just barely, you know, two acres. Just to give you an, an idea of how this would work. Again, these are just initial conceptual ideas here. Comparing this side by side, um, what is required? What, what changes as you move up levels? So with level one and it's through level three, all of them have avoidance and minimization requirements. That's an important concept. Second, Secondly, they all have some type of cumulative impact analysis. For level one, it's a limited cum cumulative impact analysis that already is taking place if mitigation will be performed out of county. It has two levels of review, and the approval is by, would be by the EPD assistant manager. Level two, instead of just a limited cumulative impact, now you also add a secondary impact analysis to this. You have three levels of review, and EPD manager would have to approve these types of permits. When you get to level three, now you require a detailed cumulative impact analysis, secondary impact analysis. You add a new alternative analysis, and I'll be describing what these analyses are in a minute. Four levels of review and approval would come from the board. So that's, that's the idea. Why are these different? How are these different? So what are these analyses that we are adding on here? Starting with cumulative impact analysis, it's basically looking at the combined incremental effects of, the, of an activity as it poses threat to the environment. This is typically required by the Army Corps for a standard permit. So once you jump out of the notice general permit, you have to do a cumulative impact analysis. Impacts could be direct, indirect, or and cumulative. So they could be, you could have those together combined. A very robust cumulative impact analysis is actually difficult. It's quite a lot of effort to prepare due to complexity and also often lack of information. This is why we added a more robust as you went up a level. And cumulative impact analysis does, it has to include reasonable, predictable, and practical considerations. A secondary impact analysis is actually looking at the effects on a resource that do not result from the direct fill or dredge. Um, so, for example, we are looking at things such as Changes in wetland size. What does that do when we change the wetland size? Fragmentation. Now we fragmented the wetland that's left there. Um, vegetation composition might change, alter, uh, threatening in uh, T and E species, so listed species. What does that do? And in general, landscape, you know, fragmentation. So we are looking at these other indirect impacts, basically. And the indirect impacts can reduce the ability of wetland function of other wetlands that you did not directly impact. Yeah. Final analysis, which is new, a newly added requirement, currently the county is not performing this, is the alternatives analysis. So the source of the alternative analysis is really from NEPA. Uh, typically there's, there's a very strict established framework. You have on your right hand side, I just bought a copy of typically the steps of what an alternative analysis requires. Um, Army Corps does require that for standard permit. Uh, there is definitely, depending on the scale of the impact, 
a different level of detail, but these are significant documents and analysis that are required. So you have to actually look at multiple alternatives, compare these, including no work, no action, as well as additional reasonable and practical alternatives. And then you have to select the least damaging alternative for your project. Um, obviously, they all include avoidance immunization and compensatory mitigation. So this is a much more in-depth analysis that would be required for anything that would go into a standard permitting level three. So I mentioned before that besides wetland function and impact, uh, wetland impact area, we also had other factors, um, modifiers that we wanted to include in determining in what levels of standard permit are we looking at. We're we looking at a one, a two, or a three. So there's three types of modifiers. The first one is what we call on-site features. So for example, do we, that's an important modifier we certainly want to include. Um, is this wetland vulnerable? Is this one of the wetlands that we're losing the most in the county? Um, is this, for example, is a lot or infrastructure 100% within wetlands? There's really no upland space at all in this lot. So those are basically characteristics that are on site of that specific site. We also want to look at landscape features. For example, is there connectivity to an outstanding Florida uh, water? Is, there a, is this part of wildlife crossing or a corridor of importance? Is it within a special protection area? So those are what we call landscape areas, features, that we are considering for modifiers. And finally, future use, so activity. <coughs> is this for a certified affordable housing project? Is there an overriding public benefit, for example, mass transit, utilities, etc.? So those are important modifiers to take into consideration. And how would these modifiers work? So the idea of it, you have here on the left what I call plus, I call those incentives or modifiers that should make the project more palatable, maybe allow a speedier review. For example, a project that provides wildlife corridor crossing or wetland enhancement projects. We certainly want to motivate those. We want to certainly have those take place. Uh, pollution remediation project, a water quality enhancement project. Those actually, you can see those are positive incentives. Depending on the combination of those, it might move a project from a level two to a level one review. On the right-hand side is what we call the deterrent or the negative modifiers. And those would be something like there is a T&E uh, wetland-dependent species on site. Um, there, uh, the functional assessment is extremely high. It's a unique pristine wetland. It is going to impact the wildlife corridor. It's located within a protection area, a special protection area, or it will impact the vulnerable habitat. So those are some idea of modifiers just to give you an idea on how these work. So I want to run through a couple examples of what would, taking some historic examples of permits that, um, that we had in Orange County and running them through the new process. First example would be an NGP, something that would now, instead of going through the original permit, would, would qualify, likely would qualify for a notice general permit. For example, in East Orlando, we had a single family home site, class three wetland, uh, wetland forested mix, this is a picture of it, 0.17 acres would be the total, was the total impact. Under the existing code, the process took about 19 months from initial application received, and there was obviously several complications. You can hear, see here all the steps. There was a CAD uh, application, CAD was issued, there was um, a CAI application, there was a denial letter initially, there was appeal. So lots of RRIs, a lot of staff time was spent on a 0.17 acre for a single family house. In this case, we have the idea would be they would apply for an NGP uh, field for a single family home. They would have to, again, meet several criteria. I don't have all the criteria here, but we would be checking things such as, is this a vulnerable wetland type? Is it outside of a, a special protection area? Um, is it adjacent to the outstanding Florida waters? Does it have any T&E species? Is it less than 0.25 acres? It's the initial number we're looking at. And in this case, it, it met all those. So it would be approved as a notice general permit. And basically, it would follow this schedule that basically we would have a SCAD and CII done simultaneously, one site visit, 
and it will be a, a much, much faster process. So this is basically NGP would receive, you would have staff review, team leader review, and would be approved by administrator. So the, the steps would certainly shorten. On the other hand, I wanted to bring in a permit that would qualify for a standard permitting level three example. So in this case, we're talking East Orlando, multifamily residential impact. We're looking at class two impact, almost 12 acres located in a, a special protection area. Uh, freshwater marsh, again, we're looking at some of these freshwater marshes uh, having some significant fragmentation issues. <coughs> Under the existing code, the process that took place was actually the application was received, staff reviewed it, there was avoidance immunization, uh, and this was actually reviewed uh, at consent, in the consent agenda, and there was a conceptual approval by the board, and a CAI was in the future you know, issued, and a final permit was um, issued for this wetland. On the other hand, this wetland would clearly, and this actually were three different scores, but I picked one for purposes. We're talking over 10 acres, so we're looking at at least a, a standard permitting level two. It's located, however, inside a special protection area and is a vulnerable wetland type. Because of that, we would recommend it to be reviewed as a standard permitting level three. So under revised code, the application would be received, staff reviewed, there will be a requirement to do secondary impact analysis, cumulative impact analysis, robust one, and an alternative analysis before you went to team leader review, administrative review, assistant manager review, manager, and BCC approval. So we're talking about a much uh, more scrutiny uh, in this type of impact um, than previously was seen. So that was the bigger topic, <laughs> the tiered permitting approach. Jumping on to the next topic, adding special protection areas. So as you know, you already have spe several special protection areas, the Wakaiva River Protection Area, Wakaiva River Study Area, those are in green. Uh, the, the protection area, the study area is a little larger, the dashed. The Econ River in blue, and then the newer Innovation Way Environmental Land Stewardship Program Area is in red in this map. We cut under consideration right now, we are looking at adding protection areas to Shingle Creek, which is in the pink, purple here on the map, and maybe portions of the St. John's River watershed, which is east. So right now, again, these are just general areas. These were not refined yet, just to give you an idea of the areas we're looking at in general. Um, the idea would be that this would be used, again, as one of the modifiers, right, in the permitting process. It will be added. Uh, potentially require additional upland buffer areas and even maybe additional requirements we'd be looking at. And so this would be on the new areas versus on the, the currently existing special protection areas. So that's a pretty easy recommendation to go through. The next one is establishing upland buffers. As I mentioned, currently in code, there's no specific upland buffer specified. So what we wanted to do with upland buffers was really use science. Uh, there's a lot of data out there on how important upland buffers are. And one, part in, one important part of it is that uh, it really the upland buffer uh, is dependent on the objective you're trying to meet. So depending, are we just trying to protect from direct human impact, from trash destruction to the wetlands? Are we trying to protect for climate regulation, wildlife, pollutant, reducing pollutants, uh, flood mitigation? There's so many benefits of having upland buffers and depending on the objective you want to meet, you have completely different sizes of buffers. So what you can see here on the right hand side is one of the papers that tried to summarize and explain that, well, we really need upland buffers for, you know, if we want to remove uh, pollutants, you need a certain size. When you start looking at wildlife, typically that's when you start requiring huge wetland buffers. And really they're species dependent, very variable. As you can imagine, an amphibian that doesn't move a lot and would require a smaller wetland buffer than some of the other ones, mammals that might be dependent on the wetland. 
So there's research uh, specifically on nutrients. I know that's a water quality impacts is a really important one. And um, quite a bit of research points to 150 to 200 feet of buffer are the maximum removal of nitrogen, maximum, so optimum removal of phosphorus and nitrogen uh, achieved by a wetland. But typically, uh, buffers with 80% vegetated uh, are, um, you know, effective around 100 feet, 100 to 200 foot. As I mentioned, wildlife typically requires a bigger buffers for just aquatic buffers for, you know, animals depending from the aquatics. We're talking about 100 to 200 feet when we start looking at um, animals that live upland and in aquatic, we're looking at as much as, you know, 600, 700, 800 feet buffers, which obviously those would not be reasonable uh, in the permitting realm. Be nice. But <laughs> so looking at putting 130 st studies, there's been a meta-analysis done. Really, most of these studies took place in Florida, which is nice. And what I did is I brought in the study and plotted this, the distribution of what they recommended as minimum. So this is minimum buffer size distance. And on the bottom, you see they are aggregated by type, by objective. What were they trying to look at? For example, flood attenuation, sediment removal is a big one, 21 studies on that. Wildlife is always a huge one, 59 studies on wildlife. Um, and, you know, water quality, et cetera. So if you put the line through and try to at least capture about half of most of those objectives and at least touch on, you know, that's the 25th percentile of the minimum, on the wildlife, we are looking at 100 feet. So it was based on this meta-analysis and looking at all the data put together that our recommendation is to go with a minimum of 100 foot of natural undisturbed buffer for all sites with a few exceptions, NGPs and uh, center permitting level ones on proje projects on small lots. So they don't have the size to be able to do that. In all cases, minimum 25 feet, average of 50 foot buffer. If required buffer cannot be provided, it will require mitigation and other measures. For example, you want to make sure you have a wildlife friendly fencing will be required. We're considering larger buffers, as I mentioned, as one of the modifiers, uh, for example, in locations such as connected OFWs, in special protection areas, some sp specific habitat, and maybe to protect species nesting on site. So there's our considerations if there may be additional buffers for those. This is an example of a wetland we actually inspected. Um, so a CE that had no buffer and you can see the direct impact of just human disturbance and trash. So it, it's very visible the difference when you have a well-preserved buffer versus not. And finally, covering mitigation approach recommendations. So uh, recommendations really focus on conservation easements. Really, we want to codify that these small conservation easements for offsetting impacts and NGPs and uh, standard permits level one on small parcels are not acceptable. Typically, these are not fully functional, uh, well-preserved CEs that will last as you want them to. For larger developments and parcels, allow CEs only with monitoring and maintenance requirements in perpetuity. So the maintenance and monitoring that would be required in perpetuity would go something like monitoring requirements. You would do it annually for the first five years and perhaps allow every two to three years subsequently. Maintenance requirements would have a goal of less than 5% exotic use and species <coughs> presence, allow conservation easement fencing. That's an important one. It's obvious to us that sometimes mowing was occurring on uh, some of these buffers and trash removal requirements. So those are some of the maintenance topics that would go under that perpetuity agreement with um, the landowner, basically. Just bringing this to summarize the objectives and how we are trying, what method we're trying to use to be able to meet those objectives. Again, we're trying to develop a defined process for very minor routinely approved impacts. We would do that with a notice general permit. We want to protect the most valuable um, wetland system, so the tiered standard permitting system tries to do that by looking at functional as a key factor um, of the permitting level. 
more predictable outcomes. Uh, they can aid planning and review. We'll have the ideas to develop very specific application forms, clear criteria, and written approach, how you evaluate on what everyone has to submit for each type of permit. Um, better wetland protection for specified upland buffers, 100 foot minimum buffer except for NGPs, um, and center permitting ones on small lots. And finally, incentivizing in county mitigation, we're looking at incentives for in county mitigation or use of wetland conservation <coughs> trust funds donations. Uh, as an incentive. Just wanted to close this off by um, highlighting what are some benefits in terms of protecting natural resources of the initial recommendations. First, the level of review for wetland impacts will be based on function using UMM, state approved, not just size and connectivity. And that's important because we do want to promote uh, protection of the higher functioning wetlands. Um, and additionally, because some of some wetland types that are currently appear to be vulnerable, such as wetland wet prairies, these are typically small in size. They will benefit from higher level of protection using this type of system. Ensuring clear, consistent, and transparent approach with using science to drive the review process. So allowing staff to dedicate their time to protecting those critical resources. And finally, requiring rigorous data analysis review for the more significant wetland impacts, such as a de detail, cumulative impact analysis, secondary analysis, and the newly added alternative analysis requirement. And for moving back to Tim, just wanted to bring up the vision, tie this in to the vision 2050. Uh, as you know, one of the policies was for the county to discourage impacts to wetlands or surface waters that have significant value and incorporate regulations into county code that will limit impact to this system. So we are actually have provided some of, during the state of the wetland mapping effort as well, some of these recommendations are providing some guidance and tools for the county to develop this initial tool, which basically allow them to identify important wetlands and surface waters to be included in the Compland Update Vision 2050. And if it really follows the idea of we want to protect the highest functioning wetlands. And this is, forgot, had the animation. This is the map. Uh, that has been developed by county staff based on that. In blue is the surface waters, and in green are the subset of wetlands that were considered important, the most important wetlands, and really is based on connectivity and function um, in this case. So it's not all the wetlands in the county, is the subset of those most important wetlands. And with that, Thank you, Claudia. I'm going to wrap up with a summary and our next steps here. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Listapad walked through, there are a number of recommendations to improve the permitting processes and workflow. And those include utilizing the NGP permit and the standard permit uh, in lieu of the single permit type that we have now, the CAI. Uh, recommended eliminating the class uh, one, two, and three system Utilize UMAM to determine the wetland protections, not just size and connectivity factors. And then let the size of the impact and wetland functionality, along with other factors like the modifiers she walked through, to determine the level of review, the type and level of impact analyses required, and the approval le level, whether that be staff, the EPO, or the board. She also walked through recommended special protection areas for Shingle Creek and St. John's River area. This will protect those sensitive areas as they have increasing development pressure, recommending additional upland buffer widths and other criteria yet to be defined. On upland buffers, the best science suggests minimum 100 foot, uh, which is necessary for pollutant removal and wildlife life cycles, but there may be larger or smaller buffers uh, appropriate in some cases. On mitigation, incentivize in-county mitigation, accept only larger conservation easements as mitigation, and require the maintenance and monitoring in perpetuity. So where are we going from here? Uh, the next step is uh, to take the board's feedback that we hear today, along with these initial recommendations, and begin um, additional integration with our stakeholders. We're going to be doing that now through uh, midsummer this year, 
and that will provide an opportunity for them um, to weigh in on these recommendations prior to even drafting the ordinance so that we can be sure that we incorporate um, their ideas. And those stakeholders will include um, the local development industry, NGOs, but also governmental agencies and our municipalities. Um, additionally, the general uh, public will have a stakeholder meeting as well. So the idea is each of these uh, groups will have their own opportunity to weigh in in a uh, stakeholder meeting. So our timeline for the year is to have those stakeholder meetings through midsummer. And then even already, we're beginning to cobble together um, some draft ordinance along with uh, some our vendor supporting that effort. Uh, we, this month, are already scheduled to shop these same recommendations with uh, those four advisory boards, LPA, EPC, DAB, and SAB. And um, the idea there is to also get their input and feedback before we even come up with a draft. We'll be going back before them um, before we have a work session with the board in September here on the draft ordinance. So we'll shop the draft with them um, late summer, August. Then we'll be back before them again in November before we bring the final adoption hearing, which we hope to do in December here before the Board of County Commissioners. So that's our um, calendar for the rest of the year. And then this slide I'll leave up for you. This is just to help you key in on some of the key recommendation topics. Um, so that you can provide that feedback to us. And that concludes our presentation, and we're available for questions. Thank you. All right. I, I do find it a very, very comprehensive uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, I, whenever I uh, um, see these types of presentations with all of the acronyms that you have, after I spent 40 years in law enforcement, the acronyms mean something differently. So I, I feel like I have to go between two languages in my head. So those of you who are multilingual, uh, you hear things and you have to kind of translate it into the, the current language. That's what I find myself doing with this. So Dr. Lister Pad has, has been working with me on uh, trying to understand, uh, you know, the different acronyms. So. We do uh, have a number of uh, board members who have indicated a desire to, to speak, uh, make comments, uh, give feedback at this point. So I'm going to call on them in order in which they uh, hit the button. And we'll begin with Commissioner Nicole Wilson. Yeah, no shock that I was um, very eager to hit my button. <laughs> um, you know, I like to frame these discussions. We've had some of them, you know, that have been very scientifically based and more policy based and, and we're, we're moving forward, but I like to frame them all with a reminder to everybody in the room that the voters in Orange County overwhelmingly supported the right to clean water charter amendment, which was then promptly preempted. But what that tells us is, a, is, is that the voters that are people, the people we work for support these efforts. And so even though this is hard work and there's a, you know, a long road ahead, that everything we do to protect these surface waters will continue to be supported by our boss, the public. And so, you know, I hope that lifts your wings in the days that it feels like, a, you know, a lot of work. And I, um, I want to start out with what I feel like are the things that, to me, are definitely moving in the right direction. And um, the upland buffer recommendations, the idea of going with, you know, really what we can at the max and less not possible, um, I think is, is something that science is backing. So, you know, to have that scientific um, basis in the decision for a, a robust upland buffer should give us confidence moving forward with that implementation. Um, I think the special protection areas, of course, Shingle Creek has been a, a very important topic to this board. Um, we've committed, you know, to looking at ways to protect that, and this looks like a, a great first or second or third or fourth step in that effort. Um, so I, I give a thumbs up to that. Additionally, the rigorous alternatives analysis. I think that anyone that's paid attention to the afternoon sessions where there are wetland impacts and my criticisms of the idea that nobody seems to actually present alternatives when the alternative analysis is required currently by code. You know, it's literally currently required. I've never seen one in my time here as far as what are the alternatives? What are you actually showing us that you can't do in order to say that you, can't, you must do this impact. Um, 
I think that when we consider that type of articulation, the one that we're looking at for the potential alternatives, that we also need to apply that. I have, a, you know, and I'm going to kind of transition in here into my concerns. I still have concerns about the tiered permitting approach. Um, you know, you don't have to be a Floridian for long to know that there are some very sophisticated developers who understand how to get, they, they build a great team of, of scientists who believe that that's how they should use their science and um, lawyers who, who will beat us up with every word. So it's important for us to really nail down the words and language and to look for areas where that may be gamed. And, you know, I think of, for instance, for me, when I, when I was listening to my briefing yesterday, was, you know, for a single family home, I think we're all like, oh, that's reasonable, right? It's one home. We're really going to have to consider what's on that single parcel. But, you know, what would prevent and how do we articulate the ability for a sophisticated um, developer to just then go through that process for several single family homes in different applications or to be able to somehow chop it up so that those look like smaller impacts, but the overall development plan is for a larger impact. And I think, you know, understanding the, um, the goal is to really protect our most um, beneficial wetlands, we have to acknowledge that they're shrinking every day, that every afternoon and every other Tuesday there's some shrinkage. So my other concern is that inherently what are right now our most precious and beneficial wetlands, the next tier down will be all that's left, and then how do we define those? So, you know, when those most beneficial ones are no longer the most beneficial because of encroachment, because we don't currently have the buffering requirements, because we don't currently um, <coughs> give them what they need as far as their beneficial status under the current code, um, until we get there, that next tier down is still really important. So, you know, and also seeing the, the data and the research about what happens during, you know, after development in a, in a in you know a heavy flood area at time, um, are we looking at using historic flooding as part of that evaluation? I know that scientifically, um, you know, we've got some great basis, but socially and responsibility for us talking about these things, are we looking at that as you know another angle for the criteria? So. Um, I think the other part that I just wanted to try to make sure that I articulated my um, concern and, and, and hope that we can really hone in on it is the modifiers. Um, they can also be up for interpretation or be subjective, and I think that we've got to make sure that, that if we are allowing for modifiers, either beneficial or not, I think we've all seen um, development plans come forward that had really significant and consequential impacts to our environment, but then they dress it up with like, but look, there's going to be a community garden and I'm going to put a bridge over a, you know, a cute little uh, wildlife corridor. And if that's three modifiers, what are we giving up? And so, you know, for me, making sure that we kind of keep that greenwashing lens on for a great um, product coming forward from a, a development plan, I think, you know, if they have really good substantive ideas, yes, let's work with them. I love that. But if it's greenwashing and they're just adding a modifier by definition because we said that, you know, adding a wildlife uh, crossing would be a modifier, what does that really mean? You know, are, where are, they, are they crossing from my yard to Commissioner Moore's yard? Or are they really crossing, you know, a dangerous highway? And those are the things that we want to take a look at and, and sort of really nailing down uh, the parameters for that. Um, you know, and, and I think for the, um, the engagement with the public, I think it's been, you know, obviously really good because this has been timed out. That being said, time is of the essence. So I, I, I would hope that our development community, people that agree with this, that, that have been working with us, we have some great partners in that community, that you start looking at the way we're approaching this and just voluntarily join us right now in figuring this out and bring forward things that we're not in a wrestling match over, over what we know is going to keep us alive and well into the future. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your work. Commissioner Moore. Before I ask a question, what is greenwashing? Greenwashing is when, you know, the idea of making something look environmentally friendly or environmentally conscientious when, um, you know, it's getting a plastic bottle <laughs> and seeing on it that it is a highly recyclable plastic bottle, right? So this is still not the best alternative for your environment. This is. Um, 
a development plan will come in and oftentimes be very impactful in its um, site plan to whatever the topography is there. It's going to change literally the natural flow of the water. It's going to change the entire wetland structure. It's going to destroy the buffers. But the application will also have this great rendering with a electric charging station in a community garden with native plants and what are we giving up for that window dressing and which one of those things is really going to keep our community safe and healthy into the future okay all right um i have a series of questions and they should hopefully be real quick answers or i won't have time to to um ask them all and when we were she was going through the examples um I, I was interested in, in the NGP that we went from 19 months down to one to two months. But in the second example with 11.95 acres, I didn't hear the difference in the timing between the current process and the proposed process. Yeah, that, that's a good observation. Um, we, we, can, we can provide that to you, Commissioner, if you'd like it, but um, the, the timeline for that second example was was not put up there um, that I, I can tell you I because I, I did research that permit a little bit myself I know it was a uh, one of those that went before the board on consent um, and uh, it was it was approved on consent and it was based on future approval of the PSP <coughs> so the PSP got approved at DRC and then the PSP came back before the board and that that finalized that conceptual permit that had been reviewed on consent. Um, I, I would expect that that permit probably took um, at least six months. It might have been as, as long as 12 months, but that was primarily due to um, the board action that was required. There was not an extensive, um, in fact, I, I did not find a request for additional information in the file that staff had sent on that one. Um, so our point of showing that was it, it, it received a rather expedient review for what it was, almost 12 acres of wetland impact um, in the econ protection area, and that going forward, we would propose that kind of request, get more scrutiny, more analysis done, and um, additional data provided, and that it would come forward in the future as a public hearing, a standalone public hearing. So that will take longer, probably. Yeah, that type of request we would recommend should uh, take longer and, and receive more scrutiny. Um, and and, and obviously there, there's obviously competing interests here. I mean, we want to protect the environment, but we know time is money to, to development. And so you don't see at that second level where we can have scrutiny, but also reduce the time factor. Because if, if you're asking these developers to give up land, which we want to protect the environment, that the trade-off for them could be, could the, the process take less time? Because time is right. money. And so is there any uh, ability to work on that second tier to, to reduce time, but yet be more thorough? Yeah, they they could. Um, so the, that whole the whole the whole scheme is designed to um, drive um, during the design phase of a project to decrease the amount of impact, so that they can um, get to those lower level tiers. You know, to go from what might initially be a two down to a one because they've designed their impacts to be less than two acres. So um, it'll it'll drive the behavior to downsize the amount of impact um, and hopefully uh, to the extent that they could get into the NGP permit um, area where it's such a small and minimal impact they could get a very expedient review so so if you came in and said now you're going to have 250 feet of buffers and so now that'll take you because you're going to impact it less you could go back to the NGP which was uh, one to two months uh, conceptually I don't think that any one modifier necessarily is going to bump the level of review downward or upward we still need to discuss internally how to weight each of those types of modifiers so um, providing a wildlife crossing it it it, it may um, not weigh as much as if you're doing a project that has an overriding public benefit we we still need to discuss what what weight should each of those modifiers get and, and then what are the what is the range uh, when you add up the weights, what is the range that each, the, the total for the project would trip it um, into moving it up or down? We haven't developed that yet because it's a little more um, code language, a little more in the weeds on the topic. 
Um, but today we're just presenting you the concepts. No, no, and I understand that. So then um, when you were talking about mitigation, you talked about buffers, fencing, mitigation, maintenance, and then monitoring. Are those basically the, the tools that we have at this point or you're proposing? Are um, there more? We, we currently... Um, we currently require um, a buffer. It's 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 based on comp plan language because that's as Dr. Listopad mentioned, it's actually not in our code today. Um, and then we do if they can't prov if they can't provide because it's a small lot, um, the minimum 25 foot buffer. We do allow them to offset that or to um, mitigate the potential secondary effect of the project by doing fencing wildlife friendly friendly fencing, planting uh, hedgerows, uh, conservation, signage, those kinds of things, um, and, a com and a combination of mitigation. So they might, they might buy some credits additionally on top of those other things in some cases to offset their lack of a buffer. Okay, and signage, what just says is a conservation area, and be careful. Yeah, it's just the, <laughs> just the sign that um, this is a conservation area, you know, no, no grading, land clearing, um, that kind of thing. Well, it still sounds fairly complicated. I, I, how, how do you say to a, somebody who's going to buy a piece of property, how could they quickly do some analysis or get an initial opinion before they buy a piece of property and it turns out they can't use that much of it? I mean, we're trying to deter this. It seems like for the sake of the people who invest that maybe they should have some understanding to deter them before maybe they even buy the property and not in this lengthy process that's going to cost thousands of dollars. What would you say to that? Um, well, uh, of course, they, they should utilize an environmental consultant um, that has experience in the industry. We actually maintain a vendor list uh, for those consultants that do work in the county, and we can help advise uh, a landowner um, and, and provide them our list. Uh, it's going to get... The process is going to get simpler in that a lot of our ambiguous terms and fuzzy criteria that are a result of a 35-year-old code are going to be clarified. And this NGP process is going to be so crystal clear for them to utilize if they, if they just have a minimal impact. It's, it's going to be expedient um, and clear. And um, we'll be updating our applicant's handbook uh, as we get into 2024 and once we have a new code in place. And that will help um, clear up our policies and procedures for folks. But it is going to, it is going to get more complex um, for those larger types of impacts into higher quality wetlands. Well, that's, that, that sounds good. Um, and then when you, the, the last point I want to make with the, with the um, different areas that we want to protect. So many um, acreage, so much of the acreage is sitting in, in municipalities. And so um, if I come in... I guess I need to back up. So we have the Army Corps, we have the water management districts. Is this an, an additional layer for folks? Um, how would you describe that if I come in, I have to deal with the Army Corps, I have to deal with St. John Water Management, and now this additional scrutiny from the county. Is that how you see it, or you see them working a little more um, in line with one another? Um, well, we, we already represent an additional layer of review, and um, I... I I would say, as Dr. Listepad uh, talked about in her presentation, that none of what we're asking for are things that are new uh, concepts that, you know, are, are completely off the wall. These are all things that um, the agencies, the other agencies already ask for, depending on the project type. Um, and so we're just implementing them into our code because we're not getting any of the data that is beneficial when making our decision. You're not getting data from these agencies? Um, well, they're not. No, those agencies aren't sending us any of this. We can we can go find it um, in their permitting database. Um, but what we're saying is, we think that these kind of analyses, um, that in some cases are already being provided to the other agencies, that uh, we should have in our code the same um, types of analyses as a requirement and receive them so that we can um, incorporate them into our review of the project. Well, it's important to have somebody. I mean, you have. I think we have the the better ability to monitor. I'm gonna leave you with this story, and I won't mention the name of this neighborhood. But 
It's in my district. I'll just leave, tell you that. So they were interested in doing a swap and had to go to FWC on this land because they were trying to save a portion of their golf course. FWC came out, and they were really trying to put their best foot forward because they want to swap and preserve the golf course. They don't want to have more development in this environmentally sensitive area. But when FWC came out, they had a whole page of violations they didn't really understand. Trash, fences broken down, um, neighboring people were farming and doing things into this nature area. And now they want to swap. You can imagine, I don't you know how this agency is going to prove it after they weren't maintaining this area very well to start with. And so I hope in this whole process, and I've mentioned this before, that um, in the monitoring piece that you know we're going to have the staff to help. I don't think they did any of that deliberately. How could they? were wanting to save the golf course but didn't really have the knowledge how to maintain this gopher tortoise <laughs> conservation area. So I hope you put into this in layman's terms, you know, in the ability to help and assist these HOAs with maintaining. And if that, not usually my normal style, but if they need to have an inspection once a year, I don't think that's a terrible thing after what we saw here. Um, they were just totally out of their league and their ability and their talents as a HOA board to, to figure out what to do with this conservation area. So we talk a lot about new development, but I hope we don't lose the older developments, the existing developments in this process. And so I would support, um, I see Mr. Williams here from Winter Garden. You know, if we can get this somewhat simplified, I would support trying to work with these municipalities because they don't always have the staff to do what we can do. And so these are still issues that have to be worked out the balance. You heard me on one side now, on the other. There has to be a balance between the, the property rights and the maintenance and the ease for people to, to comply. And that's, that's all I have. All right, uh, Commissioner Uribe. <clears throat> I'd like to start off by thanking you guys for all the hard work, diligence, education, tours, and so forth you've given me, given us. Um, I do want to kind of... I guess backtrack more on the legislative side. You know, we see a lot of changes coming out of Tallahassee. Um, always not so better for us at the local at the local level. Are we keeping an eye on that? Because one of the things that is very very frustrating is consistency. You know, we can have a set of rules and plans and guidelines, but if the state supersedes us, you know, we lose that ability to really impact and set those going forward. And just curious because we never know, you know, what, what happens on a daily basis out there. And are we keeping track and, and are we in line? Because it seems like certain organizations have ears of certain people who can try, you know, I understand what you're doing. And, um, you know, people say, well, it's already in the past. All these things have been done. But if we don't actually do something now, you know, what are we going to say? Well, it's always been that way. And just curious on that feedback, are we keeping an eye on what's going on at the state level that could impede what are some of the things that we're trying to put forward? Um, good question, Commissioner. Um, the county attorney's office does do a great job of keeping us informed um, of legislation going on in Tallahassee. Also, um, there, there are various um, people at EPD uh, who serve on the boards of local county groups uh, and local environmental agency groups. Those groups are really active in um, responding and, and gathering comments from um, the, the, the respective groups and providing those to legislatures, legislators in Tallahassee. So I think we do have um, a good finger on the pulse of what's, um, what's, what's up, up there, what's been proposed, monitoring it um, from week to week to see if it um, keeps moving or not so I feel like we do have a good a good handle on that so we'll know more once the dust all settles and and we'll really know when you go to give our work sessions on this hopefully we'll be able to take that data and really kind of adapt it to what's making sure everything's in allowed use for us um, we'll we'll certainly be um, developing the ordinance uh, with the county attorney's office and so any of those concerns about What's, what's going on in Tallahassee will be incorporated. Which now takes me to my follow-up on that. Some of us up here have significant municipality overlay in our communities, okay? I, for instance, have three cities 
who don't have the same rules and criteria that we do at the county. And so what I'm constantly hearing, well, if you won't let us, we're going to go into the city of Orlando or we're going to go into blah, blah, blah. And, and that's very difficult because we're, we're almost, you know, I've, I've had situations I'm dealing with one now where if they don't like to play by the rules or the standard is set too high at the county level, I hate to say it, municipalities gladly take that tax and impact revenue and we'll, we'll take it and it, it makes it very hard a lot of times on things like this. And, um, and just your take on it because I, I, for instance, I pretty much have borders all over. You know, I've got areas where, you know, we just had with the IFA Center, you know, where the city of Orlando has literally flooded my IFA Center because of how they've built up five feet and so forth. And, and it's very, very frustrating, you know, and actually something as pure as the IFA Center where they grow things and we have bees and honey and all that. And yet city of Orlando standard is not our standard, nor, and, and I feel like people know, developers know that. And so it's, we now have this humongous, you know, industrial compact that people who look out their house are looking at these high buildings and the IFA Center itself and all that beauty is going to look to the left and just have this, you know. And, um, and it's just, it's difficult. And have we thought about that, engaged that? Because what we don't want is we don't want people to continually say, you know what, forget this. I'm just going in the city. And how do we handle that aspect of it? So um, a couple, I, I think you had at least a couple uh, topics in there. One was um, ele elevating new development um, and it, you know, being higher up than the adjacent uh, development in the IFAS uh, location was, was your example. I, you know, we, we have a couple uh, really terrific stormwater management work sessions coming up. Um, and I'll, uh, so I'll probably defer that conversation um, uh, to that to that work session because that's really um, that's really where that elevated development and, and the reason for it is focused. Um, but uh, in, more in, in my wheelhouse is the annexation issue. Yeah. Um, that that's a that's a tough nut to crack. I, I will tell you what we are doing to um, get our uh, heads around it. Um, as I mentioned in the stake, upcoming stakeholder meetings, I, I, I plan um, to have one solely for the municipalities to come. Um, you know, I, I think it's important for them to have their, a standalone work session where there's not a lot of noise um, from the development community so that they can tell us, are any of these recommendations, you know, going to significantly impair their development review process for one? Um, so that we can begin to make adjustments where we can to potentially, and this will be an attorney's office evaluation um, this year and next, it, 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 is the charter going to be applicable in, in their municipality or not? Of course, that depends on the current policy that talks about whether their ordinance is more restrictive or as restrictive as the county's. Um, but at the ground level here in developing this ordinance, we're bringing them in and we're going to get input from them. Um, and then once we have our uh, house in order, if you will, and have a, a clear uh, wetland ordinance in place, um, then w with the county attorney's office, we'll begin to review um, applicability regarding the charter. Okay. And I, I want to follow up, and I've mentioned this before, as a quality of the wetland, quality of the water, of the conservation area. What legal, okay, so Commissioner Wilson actually mentioned where she hadn't heard about a particular development. I have one where it was a class one right at the front of the entrance and it's the only way onto the property. And we did get the credits and so forth. But we were able to negotiate a conservation area. Now, completely surrounding this one and a half acres is complete development, okay? Um, that conservation area <coughs> has had homeless camps. That conservation area is dirty. The county was just recently in there cleaning it up. And so when we talk about the quality of, of conservation areas or wetlands and, and things like that, what legal rights do we have and have we been keeping track of all these to actually check on the status of it? You know, and, and so, because that one already worries me. We, we only approved it last year and it's already 
had trash and, and, and debris and, and people living there. So here's this conservation area. And I'm, and I'm noticing these, especially in my district, which is very dense, where we have these pockets of type one wetland and conservation areas, but all around it, there, there's nothing that goes into a natural buffer. They're all surrounded by development and concrete and so forth. And so will we have the ability to actually continue to monitor and, and know the quality and what legal ability do we have of that in its essence also? So going forward, we're proposing to have um, better uh, monitoring and reporting for the longer term. Um, Oh, just to back up, you, you need to understand that not all conservation areas, and, and um, for purposes of this conversation, I'll use conservation easement uh, because in our, in our code, all wetlands are conservation areas. But I think you're talking about specifically areas Yeah, one that was dignified a conservation area, yeah. So it could not be developed gotcha. or cleared in the, in the future. So there's, there's all different species of conservation easements. There are um, those from days of yore, which are 30, 40 years old, that have very little um, rest restrictions. They, they, the county code still applies, or you can't clear in there. But regarding trash pickup or um, maintenance, ma maintenance, th those old um, conservation easements from antiquity, uh, we, don't, we don't enforce any of that type of stuff, just, just grading, clearing. That kind of that kind of issue. Um, then there are um, uh, presently even um, there are areas that get put under conservation easement, but they didn't offset an impact, so they weren't mitigation for anything. They're just extra wetlands that were left on site. And again, those don't um, typically trip our radar uh, for having an issue, because again, if it if they're not clearing the wetland in some way or or filling it. Um, it's not a violation of code for it to have trash um, or nuisance exotic plants in it. The, the, ones that we, the ones that we do have that kind of enforcement capability would be those that are set aside as mitigation to offset another impact, um, some fill to some wetland on site as, that was done as part of the project and authorized in the permit. Those type of conservation easements uh, we we do actively um, enforce uh, if if they're not they those are also monitored for and re right. we receive reports for the first five years we we assess those reports if there's an issue uh, we correspond back with the applicant's designee and saying you need to clean, you need to do a trash pickup you need to do some kind of supplemental planning there was some mowing that occurred you need to talk to the um, HOA and and fix this issue or we don't we don't release them from monitoring and reporting until those issues are resolved so what we're proposing to do is no longer um, turn them loose after five years if everything looks self-sustaining and looks good we would continue every two or three years thereafter to require another report and those reports continue to come in forever so that we can keep better tabs on what is that wetland um, looking like out there that was permitted, you know, 10 years ago as part of a offset of an impact. But doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of what we're doing? Because we don't, you know, a lot of times when we have mitigation credits, they're not on the property, okay? So they're somewhere else. But we do realize that those wetlands are on the property. We do realize that they're unbuildable. You know, there's, you know, there's upland where you can build and there's not. So we're essentially allowing, we're just looking the other way when it's where we, where we habitate with them. And then the ones that you guys are controlling aren't really the ones being impacted in our communities. And so essentially they can become polluted, they can become trash, they can become all that. And we have no recourse. And I would love to see something where we would still be able to, to monitor and see it because I, I remember there was a case that I was, I was particularly taken by and I met with your team, and it was a quality one wetland, but because of what had happened around it over the last couple of decades, the value of that quality of wetland did not continue to exist as it did now. And, and essentially, we're saying that going forward. So those now become compromising areas in the future because it was never kept up, continue, you know, continue, it degraded because we had no oversight. It was built 
all around it. So then those now actually become plausible, usable, because look at the quality that it is. And, and we hear that a lot, the quality of the wetland, you know. And so it would be nice to see that. I don't know legally how much our reach would be on something like that, but it's so discouraging to be so proud to have a conservation area that's left on, on a property, but then to know that it'll, it means nothing, just to have a sign that says conservation area and don't mow it, you know. All right, thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have another item this morning, so to, to staff commissioners, if we can kind of ask our questions, kind of frame them very quickly, and staff, if you can give responses very quickly, otherwise uh, we will not manage the time very well today. Commissioner gomez Cordero. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, actually, I have um, several questions, and two of them have been answered already, which was for the um, NGP and also the upper lands buffer so but I have two questions um, and I think it, it, it will go with what um, Commissioner Moore and Commissioner Ribe was saying uh, who and how will these you know um, impacts or permits or whatever are going to be monitored because you know we give permit whatever whatever but who goes back and check that everything that you know was permit is, is follow through. That's one question. The other one is, what will be something that it will be uh, an impact, but still have to be done? Uh, can you rephrase that second question? It, what will be um, something, a project, or something that has to be done in, in these wetlands and so, and the impact is going to be, you know, it's going to impact the wetland, but it has to be done. What would be something? Public benefit. What would be something that you would say? So um, that would be like a, a wastewater treatment plant, uh, uh, some sort of um, electrical plant, or, or um, a mass transit project. Those kind of things um, that have public benefit that that need to be done for the uh, betterment of the of the public. Of the public. Okay. Those, those are some of the kinds of things that you could you could say they. They may need to be done. Roads. Okay. Um, Can we say roads? Can we say like sidewalks and so? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, those those could be necessary impacts. Okay. Um, to answer your first question, I think it was centered around um, our inspection process, our compliance inspection for after a permit is issued. Who who checks to make sure that they built the project in accordance with how it was authorized, we we do that. Staff does that for every um, permit that's issued. The time frame is a little different depending on the kind of project. But for wetland impacts, um, we I think I um, answered this uh, in another work session as well. So it's a good question. Um, we go and inspect it as soon as the project is um, built or nearly built. Uh, or if we're if we if we haven't been notified or we're just not aware yet that it's completed, we have a fail-safe inspection at five years out that pops up in our database to go take a look at that and make sure they built it according to the permit. Oh, okay, that's good. So after the project was approved or whatever, you used to go back like five years after. We we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we okay. make sure that. They didn't do any more wetland impacts than what they were supposed to. Uh, if they did, uh, we we bring them uh, through a permit modification process. Um, most of the time, it's just minor, minor incidental um, impact that was done. Uh, it, it happens sometimes, and so we bring them, we bring that forward as a permit modification. Sometimes it's just staff issued, um, but if, if it was an item that went to the board before, it'll be brought before the board again as a modification potentially. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bonilla. Yeah, maybe I should start pressing my button earlier because I feel like I'm yeah. being rushed, always being the last one. Um, but I, I mean, I, I love all the work that you all are doing. I really s super appreciate it. Um, but I also want to look at ways that we could be proactive as well. And so 
you know, we have this, this is all reactive, um, but definitely looking at some ways that we could be proactive in preventing people from purchasing swamp lands and trying to fill them in and develop on them. Um, you know, Florida's a great place to go buy swamp land, right? And people are tricked into buying these properties not knowing what they're getting themselves into. And then we're the ones who have to then deal with that. So how do we get ahead of that? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have any solutions for you right now. Usually I try to, you know, I don't just state a problem. I try to come with solutions too, but I don't have any today. Sorry. <laughs> Um, also, if we could simplify, I, you know, a lot of this in the end so that, um, like the mayor said, you know, he's trying to translate this, <laughs> you know, like we don't need our um, citizens trying to translate this. It should be in a way that's simplified for everyone to be able to understand. So keep that in mind when you're drafting your final version. Um, also, you know, we do have these problems with annexation. We have problems with municipalities and their what they're doing, what they allow or don't allow. Um, well, I have an idea for a solution here, but I don't know if it's feasible because um, it's going to take a lot of money. But I know in Colorado what they've done is that they've actually purchased the property around a municipality and so that it cannot be, nothing can be annexed outside of that municipality, which was very interesting. But like I said, I don't know if that's feasible. That's, that would take a lot of money. Um, but, you know, that's an idea. I know if we're buying environmentally sensitive lands now, <clears throat> I think we may not be buying that around municipalities, but at least that's a step in the right direction where we're purchasing these lands and making sure that they're protected forever. Um, and then another concern I have is that we do have some developers out there who have violations of, you know, in different properties that they've developed yet they come before us with new applications for new developments. And I just get concerned when we have bad players that are having violations continue to develop new developments and then have new violations on that, but they continually get approved and come before us. Like there's no consequence for these bad players um, because it's considered a new application and it's not related to the other. But I really feel we need to change that because if they're being a bad player and they're not playing by the rules, we shouldn't continue approving their applications. Um, and then the other thing is, um, this is going back to what I said in the beginning about being proactive. Um, we have lots of buffers in here and traditionally, you know, we've looked at these buffers and that's determined how many units could fit on a property. But how, how does density fit into this? Because let's say we put, um, you know, I'll just give the example with um, the road going through Split Oak Forest. You know, there's this huge development that they want to build, um, and then they, that development is causing the problem where now we need more roads, but th those roads now are going through environmentally sensitive lands. So how smart is that? That's not being proactive if we're approving all these high densities in areas that are surrounded by environmentally sensitive lands because now we have to, of course, get to it somehow. And so now we're building these roads through this environmentally sensitive lands, dividing the wetlands, dividing the wildlife corridors. You know, so we have to make sure that we're planning in a way to keep these wildlife corridors connected, to keep the wetlands connected. And you know, we can't just think of one development here and there and not think about the whole picture together and how it all works together. Um, and so if we could somehow work that into this so that we're, again, being proactive in preventing those situations from happening. Um, so that's why I would like to see, I, I, I see a lot of this as being um, reactive to like when a development application comes, you know, here's what we could do. But I want to see something that is more practicing into the future, like we could prevent this and prevent that from happening type of thing. Uh, no. I, uh, there is uh, one, one good news item that um, speaks to uh, at least one of those proactive approaches um, as a result of the state of the wetland study, we now have 
um, really good quality um, photo interpretation of wetlands and surface waters throughout the county. We, we hadn't had that before. We had a very um, high level scale uh, federal uh, product with the natural wetlands inventory. Um, the Florida natural areas inventory and the water ma management districts also have some land cover maps, but none of those um, are as uh, sophisticated as the one that our vendor put together for the state of the wetlands project. So we're in the middle of working with the GIS section to make that available to the public. So those people considering buying a piece of property, they will know better no, uh, going forward if they're buying a wetland area or not. Yeah, that's wonderful. And you're also working on the gopher tortoise map, too, which could help out with this as well. Um, do you have any, uh, like, wildlife corridors in mind on those maps as well, where we have some, um, uh, what's the exact term for this? You know, when a, when a species travels from one area to the other, like bears and panthers and stuff. Yeah, um, actually the, <clears throat> the map that Dr. Listpad showed that staff has developed um, that is going into the Vision 2050 called the Important Wetlands and Surface Waters, that map was actually um, developed utilizing a lot of important environmental layers that we, um, that we got from um, various institutions. One of those layers was a wildlife um, corridor map so wildlife corridors that are um, known and mapped were overlaid into that map and then where they intersected with our wetlands and surface waters was um, one of the factors that went into the creation of that map and the designation of a wetland or surface water as one of our important areas. Okay, so how can we, um, being proactive, use those maps to make sure that those aren't impacted? Uh, so. There's an accompanying new comp plan policy that was on the slide that says Orange County shall discourage impacts to those wetlands and surface waters that are depicted on that map. So that's a tool we haven't had before. Um, again, it's not a hard no to a project, but it's, it's another tool in the toolbox to utilize um, to have more pause and have a higher level of scrutiny about a project if, if it's impacting uh, wetlands or surface waters on that map. Okay, so what if they have to get to it, to their property, it's not impacting, is there, um, what's going to, are they going to still be able to build that road because if it's a, of public benefit or would they be required to do a bridge that's more protective of the corridor? What are the ideas for that? So if, if it's a project that uh, county requires a permit for and not all roads do, yeah. uh, then um, if, it, if it's crossing some uh, wetland or surface water system, always a, a, a way to incorporate a, a bridge type design is something that we work with applicants on and ask them, can, can you do this um, rather, rather than the fill for the road? Um, we currently ask that. We would continue to ask that kind of question going forward. Okay. Yeah, because I know a lot of them do culverts, and culverts are not really the best. Um, I prefer to see some bridges, but then they don't want to do it because they say it costs too much money. So how do we overcome that? Um, again, I think, I think uh, developing some of these additional tools will give us um, more, more data uh, to be able to um, give them uh, an answer that is the most protective of our resources. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Commissioner Wilson. It's just a quick, I was going to, I just wanted to um, tell Commissioner Uribe, I had the similar situation in my district because there was, you know, it's private, it's a private conservation. We, you know, we're, the, our, we're a little bit hemmed in. So meeting with the HOA and some of the residents that brought it forward because they were like kind of fed up or disgusted about it, think, and they thought it was us and it wasn't, um, it did help. And so we have like, you know, it's a little bit of a neighborhood watch program. I know that's not applicable everywhere, but the, but there are definitely residents that are interested that don't know what to do and sometimes just even empowering them by saying your neighborhood actually owns this. And you all can gra you know, grab some high school students on a Saturday and do a quick cleanup. But um, the other thing I was gonna say is that mapping, um, I try, I was telling um, Administrator Brooks that I, I try to talk to the realtors in my area about being able to access some of these maps and taking a look at these, you know, types of things. And I also talk all the time about the shoreline, shoreline and, and riparian rights because they, they don't want to also put themselves in a position when they're 
brokering a deal or negotiating a deal that they've sold something that wasn't the value that they thought it was. So, you know, it's an educational tool to be able to provide them, a, you know, a link to a map or, you know, really access to Vision 2050 and all the maps so that we all are on the same page. And I think that, that the ability to get those layers and really understand what we're, what we're working with, to me, it's like the excuse-free, you know, formula for moving forward with this update because it's... It shouldn't be a surprise. Any application comes in, we can check the maps, they can check the maps, everyone knows um, that the highest and best use isn't negotiable when we know how much of that is, you know, an essential wetland. Okay, so as, as we come to um, the conclusion of this presentation and as we segue into the next uh, portion of the agenda, a few thoughts came to mind for me. Uh, number one, um, if you think about it, we, we have a problem with uh, housing uh, availability, uh, with inventory, and uh, it is caused as a result of the tremendous growth. You know, in the last decade, our county grew by 25% alone in population. That has put a lot of pressure on the need to um, really start somewhere. And encourage and allow development that includes the building of more affordable and attainable housing. Managing uh, growth is going to be the most difficult challenge that we will face, uh, I believe, as a county. And, and planning for it is key. So this presentation is about planning for it. The next presentation will be about planning for it. And uh, then later we will talk about our Vision 2050 plan, all planning for it. So as we continue to grow, and all indications are, we are going to continue to grow as a state, we're gonna to continue to go, grow as a region and as a county. So ensuring that we do so in a responsible, sustainable way while protecting our environment and our green spaces is going to be necessary. I do believe that in terms of our strategies, we should not forget about uh, infill and redevelopment areas uh, that should be a key component of our strategy going forward. Uh, and just as uh, wetland impacts have continued uh, to deteriorate uh, over time, that's what Dr. Listerpad you know, pointed out to us, uh, the bad news here is that They'll likely continue in the future as long as our population continues to grow. Uh, but the goal of uh, all of these planning processes and land use codes or requirements is, is to minimize those impacts that we will have on our community. I want you to think about it when we think about the growth. If you think about how many of you on our board, how many of you in our audience moved here in the last uh, 30 years from somewhere else and you built the home, you purchased the home. In many ways, you are part of that migration that caused us to have to deal with these tremendous growth issues, but uh, in terms of our board and direction, we have to start somewhere. Now, Part of this conversation has been about uh, how are we going to monitor this, how are we going to enforce um, for conservation. That's some feedback that you all have that in terms of what we do going forward, we're going to have to make sure that we do as we pass various codes and uh, ordinances that we monitor them. But we have to do that in the backdrop of the environment that we're in within the state of Florida with the current um, legislative priorities coming out of Tallahassee is to certainly preempt local governments uh, and those preemptions center around restricting our ability uh, to restrict growth. And so that's the backdrop of what we are really facing and what we are up against and uh, all indications are that is likely going to continue as well. So we have to make certain that our plans are definitive, uh, that they're nimble, that they're able to adjust, but also create the kind of framework 
going forward where uh, everyone knows what the rules of engagement are in, in our community. So the balance of uh, our presentations today are going to really get after that, I think, in the presentation. So I'm going to say to uh, Tim and to Dr. Lister's Pat, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as you heard, they're going to be coming back. They're going to be doing an abundance of community engagement, listening to our stakeholders, getting feedback as we begin to kind of craft what this is going to ultimately look like. So uh, thank you to the team. And with that, we're going to move forward to the next presentation that we have, the, the last one, uh, before we hopefully take uh, a break uh, f for uh, a lunch period because we have a lot of work uh, before us this afternoon as well. And so Alan Marshall is going to come forward from our Planning and Environmental and Developmental Services Department uh, to make a presentation regarding local strategies to increase housing supply and uh, perhaps streamlining the process to some extent uh, where we can uh, to increase the production and uh, of more inventory of uh, affordable and attainable housing within our communities so that we can adequately address the issues centered around homelessness, affordability. We even heard one resident say today that um, no fault of her own, but because of uh, the hurricane, uh, she has been displaced from her home, and there's probably a lot that goes into the circumstances that, uh, that she is encountering. And uh, she's just one of many uh, who are suffering uh, from a natural disaster that was not caused necessarily directly by us, but we had a benefactors of, of the destruction from the hurricane. So, uh, Alan, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, remember, uh, let's try to move forward expeditiously. I'm trying to make your points. And then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A by members of the board. You recognize, sir. Thank you, Mayor. And good morning, uh, commissioners. As uh, Mayor Preface, we're here today actually revisiting uh, a discussion that we started back in January on local strategies to increase housing supply. Uh, that discussion with the board back in January was a much fuller discussion. We talked about market, and, you know, market uh, analysis and, and information, uh, gave you some uh, concepts uh, for uh, process streamlining, which we'll revisit again today. Uh, more acutely, but we also, in that discussion, talked about some projects that the county might get into, with missing middle. So it was a, it was a much larger discussion. So today is uh, focused on specifically those uh, streamlining uh, processes. So our presentation today will go through uh, a little bit of background. Uh, we'll talk about a new service that the county is going to be providing, uh, probably starting sometime in the summer. Uh, Nick Thaumuller with our uh, DRC uh, office, who runs our DRC office, will, will jump up uh, and talk about those three uh, time-saving strategies that you heard uh, some basic information about back in January, uh, but also providing today some additional data uh, and, and some of the information that we reviewed as, as we considered uh, whether they were appropriate to bring forward. And then I'll jump back up, do a summary, and then leave uh, a, a slide for the board for, for discussion. So. Um, as you know, at, at, at for the, at least the last year, we've had a significant discussion on the challenges that we face uh, locally uh, on with a deepening uh, housing crisis. Uh, back in August of last summer, you heard a, a lengthy presentation about uh, the housing market and the fact that it is very dynamic and has complex uh, dependencies. Overall, in this process, we want to make sure that any time that we're considering uh, development process streamlining that uh, there are th that we are mindful uh, of uh, meaningful public participation, and uh, at, at, and at the backstop of all of this, coming alongside all these efforts, is the requirement for education and, and public outreach. If you, uh, mm -hmm. I think Commissioner Wilson back in the the January discussion said, "I'm a sucker for a good picture." When we were showing some of those pictures, and that's I think that is really key to to kind of overcome some of the, you know. You know, people have maybe preconceived notions of uh, affordable housing or, or missing middle, and it's those pictures that are really going to sell it. And so that education and outreach is, is critical, and we have a team working on that. 
I think we're all well aware that multiple approaches uh, to try to dig ourselves out of the hole, and you see sort of that hole there on the, on the photo, uh, uh, the screen capture there of 25,000 units lost after the Great Recession, and then of course, the fact that we are a popular place to be and we have a lot of people moving here. Trying to overcome that is going to take a, a number of solutions to move the needle. So stakeholder feedback has been critical in this effort uh, for us going back to last August. Uh, we met originally with uh, eight to ten members of the apartment community, had about a two-hour session with them to get an understanding from them what their challenges were. This was really for them to talk to us uh, and educate us on their needs and, and their uh, you know, their practices and, and how we can help. Uh, the county administrator put together a working group that's met at least once or twice uh, that's a more broad uh, spectrum discussion uh, of those, of, of, of the challenges that we're facing. We've took uh, a lot of that information from those two engagements and used them in an innovation lab styled uh, afternoon session, and you see it in the photo there. Uh, this was a discussion with uh, housing professionals, these were housing advocates, there were people there with finance backgrounds, uh, NIMBYs and YIMBYs, we had everybody together there in that room and each of those six tables acted independently as, a, as an innovation lab. We wanted to see as we moved through these discussions with all this feedback, were we getting different answers from different groups um, to give you a sense of how, how clear a direction we see. On, on any of the issues moving forward. So the last one up there, March 2023, that's actually in, in the interim between January and now. We met um, with a, a group of those folks that we'd already had discussions specifically about the financial issues. And it just, Commissioner Moore, in the previous presentation, you talked about time equals money. And that's what we wanted to hear from them. We wanted to know where, what really was behind a lot of that. Give us a better understanding of what time equals money means to them because a lot of permit streamlining, that's what you're going to see today, is time cut out of, uh, of the overall, uh, overall process. Top feedback, the concerns, rigid technical standards, which is a lot of times what necessitates waivers, and unnecessary process loops. Those are the two that we're addressing really here today. The county's obviously working on the issues of staffing shortages, and we have a Team 400. Uh,
Okay, Jay, see if you can hear four. Check, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay. And when those standards, as they're negotiating them with county staff and uh, administration, if one of those standards uh, deviates in any way from what's in the standard code, a waiver is required. And right now, all of those waivers are required to be requested, processed, and approved at the very early PD rezoning stage. And the challenge is, at this stage, the PD land use plan is really just a general bubble plan with some conditions and standards attached to it. It's not until the later stages in the development process that the site really gets engineered with all those very more specific development details. This is at the subdivision plan stage when they're subdividing property, or at the development plan stage, which is really a kind of a pre-construction plan for multifamily and commercial development. As we discussed in January, it's often not until these later stages where we're actually laying out and looking at the very specific details of a project where we realize that, well, it turns out additional waivers are going to be needed. You've already got your zoning, now you're laying out the project, but it, in order to do it the way that you know, we think makes sense, you're going to need some additional waivers. And that requires you to essentially restart the process, submit a new application to amend the PD, and go back through the whole process again. And we found that if we were to allow waivers to be considered, processed and approved as part of the later stage preliminary subdivision plan, PSP, and development plan process. It would reduce processing time and number of duplicate applications, allow needed flexibility in the development process while still allowing for public hearings. Plus, this is already proven to be an effective and a really non-issue type of process. This is something the county already does, just only in the limited Horizon West area. So in the next slide, we've got an example of a real life project. So on the top portion here, we've got a property with a recently approved PD zoning. And they start their development plan process. 
And staff says, well, you, we love the design, we love what you're doing here, but you know, you've got a bit of a parking and a setback issue. So what happens is that the DP essentially is placed on ice. And now the applicant's got to submit a brand new application, which has to be processed by staff, reviewed separately, go through the process, ultimately considered and you know, hopefully approved by the Board of County Commissioners, and then, oop, thought there was gonna be another bump there. And then the DP gets taken off ice and is allowed to move forward, causing not only duplicate applications, but a significant multi-month delay as we can see here. So the bottom portion shows how the process would work as we're proposing. It does add, you'll notice, an extra step in the DP process of requiring a board hearing, but is much simpler, much, straightfo much more straightforward, and a shorter process overall. And this example really gets even worse in the case of a preliminary subdivision plan, which in the example of the scenario on the top would already require a board hearing of its own. So having that go back through the process, amend the PD, not only creates the five month delay, but also has duplicate board hearings for what's essentially the same request. The second streamlining proposal is to allow the staff level development review committee, which Alan talked about earlier, to review and approve a very select group of minor technical waivers. As things stand today, any waiver must be approved by the board regardless of whether it's one inch or one mile, and also regardless of whether there's any stakeholder or any compatibility issues to be considered. As we mentioned in January, what we find is there are really two groups of waivers. There are the large, significant waivers which have effects on adjacent properties. You want to take what's supposed to be a three-story building, make it 10. You want to take that 10-story building and move it closer to some single-family homes over in the edge of the property. That is, has significant compatibility concerns, and it is one of those larger, uh, major type waivers we're talking about. And then we have the very minor, very hyper-technical waivers, often internal to a project. Remember, a PD is a larger mixed-use development with lots of different types of stuff and it's going on. And as Alan mentioned, often a waiver from yourself. You know, you're building two different parts of a project. However, you mix something up internally, and you still need a waiver regardless of if you're affecting any other property owners, if there are any compatibility or major concerns or not. And it's that second group that we're specifically talking about today. These are specifically intended to be so minor that they're similar to the non-substantial changes to PDs, PSPs, and DPs that the DRC already has the authority to grant and has exercised for many decades now. And on top of that, if there are any affected parties who believe that the DRC got it wrong, if this were to be approved, the code already has provisions allowing any decision of the DRC to be appealed and heard by this board. So we've got our list here of the type of waivers that our research shows has been historically both minor and non-controversial, and really have only been associated with those larger compatibility type waivers I was mentioning earlier, just by having the name waiver alone. So as part of our research in establishing this list, you know, we really took a, a deep dive and we went back and reviewed all the projects that came through the PD process over the last several years and we identified those common requests that didn't attract any interest from the community, from the board, really from anyone. It's really at this point so minor, so hyper-technical that it's just a procedural matter. There, there's really no analysis or concern of how we're affecting other property owners. Um, it, it's again, just very procedural and hyper-technical. And we've got a couple examples here. So we see this site, typical commercial shopping center. And in a normal scenario, these buildings could be as close to each other as building code would allow. But what they've done here is they've split this site and to you know, sell to different property owners. So you've got a Arby's on one side, a McDonald's on the other. Don't know why I went with fast food, but that's the example we're going with. And simply by keeping, or by splitting and establishing that parcel line, now the buildings are clo too close because they're not meeting the parcel line boundary setbacks. So this project, again, 
needs a setback from itself when any other shopping center, had it been one parcel, wouldn't require one at all. The same thing happens in apartment complexes throughout the county. Uh, the building code, fire code, allow buildings, you know, internal to the project to be X feet away from each other. Through a quirk of the zoning code, technically these two buildings should have been 10 feet further apart, even though it meets all other codes. And taking a look at this from the pedestrian standpoint, looks like your standard apartment complex. You can't see it anywhere from inside the apartment uh, parking lot, and it, everything really kind of looks very standard. We did mention that the waivers we're talking about today are primarily internal. There are a couple examples that are external, and in this scenario, we've got a major street setback. So this is not a setback to an adjacent property, but the code requires the buildings to be set back X feet from a functionally classified roadway. Uh, however, you know, due to kind of updated trends and how we like to see development happen, staff wanted this building to be pulled a little bit closer to this road to provide a little bit more framing there. That broke code just because it's you know, getting closer to the major road, so they required a waiver to move this building. Here's an example of some of the parking dimensions. On the north and south end of this drive aisle, you've got parking spaces that are slightly different dimensions. The ones on the north, 100% compliant with code. On the south, although the same overall area, slightly different dimensions, again, requiring a hyper-technical waiver. Here's an example uh, that's another fun one. Technically, all of these homes per code need to be fronted and accessed off of a county right-of-way. However, again, due to updated uh, trends and uh, design preferences, these homes are all facing a nice green space there in the middle and are reloaded off of an alley. This requires a waiver, entirely internal to the project, better design, but still technical waiver. Now you did note, you may have noticed on there that we do have max building height. And I talked earlier about the fact that we're not talking about major, significant increases in height. But there are some quirks of the code, architectural appendages and some other type of things that are fairly minor. And by something in this particular case, you can see the red circle on the screen there. We've got the, uh, the stairwell for this student housing complex. Shut it up a couple extra feet than it should have per code. Completely unnoticeable from the ground level, in line with the rest of the development, but again, required a waiver. This is the example of what we're not talking about. Per code, this should have been a three-story apartment complex. Clearly, we notice uh, can count up to four here. And it, that's an increase in height. That's an extra story. That is specifically not included in our list of proposals when we're talking about maximum building height. So, so far we've been talking about waivers and PDs. And the third proposal here uh, takes a bit of a different approach and it looks at comprehensive plan future land use map amendments. There are two types of future land use map amendments that are defined by state statutes. Historically, the large scale amendments, which are processed twice a year, are projects larger than 10 acres and require two sets of public hearings. One set of public hearings to determine whether to transmit the request up to the state level reviewing agencies for review, and then it comes back for two adoption hearings. The small scale amendments, which are processed multiple times per year, we're always projects smaller than 10 acres. A few years ago, the state of Florida changed those definitions. And now what the statutes say is anything under 50 acres can be considered a small scale amendment. Orange County chose not to immediately adopt that definition of now our small scale amendments or anything under 50. What we chose is to stick with the old 10 acres and allow some very limited exceptions to that rule. And this is an issue for two reasons we find. First, because we've spoken to jurisdictions around the state, and so far of all the folks we've spoken to, it seems Orange County's a bit of an outlier, and that we're the only ones who didn't just adopt the 50 acre definition. Uh, there are a couple others out there, but we're in the vast major minority. And second, since the state legislature made significant changes to that state level reviewing agency in the process in 2011, 
Before that time, when we transmitted comprehensive plan amendments up to the state, we got a robust you know, report of objections, recommendations, comments. Since 2011, we've not received any meaningful recommendations, you know, changes, comments, objections from the state. And going through, we've really only received a small handful of very minor comments from them. So again, what we're asking for here, in the name of helping to increase housing supply, is to allow all multifamily projects that meet the statutory definition of a project of under 50 acres to go through the small scale future land use amendment cycle, should they request that. And we've got an example here that just kind of shows really the difference between those two cycles. You've got the small scale on the top end, which again, processed multiple times a year, basic process, submit an application, technical staff review and recommendation, community meeting, always required, and then uh, advisory board and board approval here, or of county commissioner meetings. And then the large scale amendments, again, same typical process, application, technical review, community meeting, and then you've got that transmittal, state review, and then back to the adoption hearings. And when you really think about it, if you're something that's just tipping that 10 acre threshold into the large scale, if you miss, you notice there's a difference five months to 10 months in the timing of these cycles. But since that large scale is only processed twice a year, if you miss that submittal site, submittal deadline by a couple weeks, you're not only waiting 10 months for a process, five months longer than you would for a small scale, but you have to wait for the next cycle to start. So you might be waiting 10 months to wait 10 months. Now, we realize that 50 is a large, scary number. You know, we've heard that, we understand that. But let's take a look at some of the data we've gathered. And we went back and we looked at all of the future land use amendments for multifamily projects that have been approved over the last 10 years. And looking at the graph up here, you see a lot of them are in that you know, 250, 300, 350 unit range. And this really hasn't been any particular issue. There's been no concerns that we're approving small scale amendments with these type of densities uh, in projects that are eight to 10 acres in size. So then we looked at the large scale amendments. And this is an interesting one because you look at it and the vast majority of these also within that 300, 350, up to 400 um, unit range. And the vast majority of these, as we predicted, you know, suburban, typical suburban apartment complexes are between that 10, 15 to 20 acre range. There are a few outliers. You might notice that guy way on the right there, 40. That's certainly a large project. What's going on there? If you take a look at the graph on the left, it's a little misleading because when we're talking about site acreages for the large scale, small scale, we're talking about gross acreage of the property. So that's the entire property, you know, as it is. But in Orange County, you can't develop necessarily the entire property. Your developable area and your density allowance is based on net developable area. So you've got the gross minus wetlands and water bodies, which you can't develop on. So in that particular example, it might have been a 40 acre site, but you can see over here in the difference between net developable and gross, it was only 20 developable acres. So really, move that guy right over, and it really fits within that 10, 15, 20 acre range. And with that, I'm gonna hand things back over to Alan, and then staff will be available for questions. Thank you. All right, thanks, Nick. So uh, a sum up slide for the presentation. Uh, as, as we are well aware, measures are needed to for us to mitigate uh, a deepening housing crisis. Uh, our stakeholder uh, feedback has strongly uh, supported a need for, for streamlining, and that's not an uncommon thing. We've heard that for through uh, a number of years. Uh, our permit processing times and predictability are focus areas for both us uh, and our, uh, our developers. Those new services, as I mentioned on that one slide, are uh, uh, certainly an attempt uh, at, at adding a new dimension of overall customer care uh, for, those, for those projects, especially as those projects become more complex. Uh, targeted process changes could dramatically shorten permitting times, reducing uh, costs significantly for applicants, uh, and accelerate uh, the delivery of housing. And of course, we're always attempting to maintain levels of, of public notice and engagement. So the, the, the landing slide, Mayor, here has uh, essentially three options 
that include those three options. The first is for staff, because uh, we're not, in essence, we're not approving code today. We're talking about the concepts to be able to move forward to, uh, to craft any code that's necessary to, to implement these options. Uh, but the first is to have staff move forward with option one, two, and three uh, as they've been described. And then number two would be some, uh, some deal making, some limitation potentially, or, or even, uh, even increasing them. Uh, they are uh, other than what is outlined in one, two, and three. And then the, the third obviously is uh, no changes. And so, Mayor, that concludes the presentation. Uh, we, of course, uh, have uh, staff here from Planning and Zoning, uh, our, our Interim Deputy Director, Tim Boldig, and, of course, our DCA, uh, John Weiss, here for, for comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, up to this point, uh, I do believe that we're going to have to address this issue of the lack of affordable uh, inventory within our community, and the only way that we can do that is to increase production. Until we get uh, more available units, uh, it is unlikely that the price of rental units, et cetera, is going to come down. Uh, so uh, in order to address uh, pricing, uh, availability, uh, we got to increase the inventory. So uh, streamlining to some extent is uh, what is necessary. That is going to require some, some buy-in, some trust uh, from the members of the Board of County Commission in the in staff and the process, and I, I dare say even some trust with the developers in order to deliver what we know that we need uh, at this time. The only way that we can adequately address the homelessness issues uh, is to address housing-related uh, issues, and uh, I think uh, if we can help stimulate our economy with the production of uh, housing uh, that creates jobs, that creates economic opportunities for our families, and so it is the way that we have to move forward. Uh, just how we do that is up for d further discussion. We're going to start with Commissioner Christine Moore at this time. Okay. Uh, I first want to say thank you for, um, uh, before you ask for these three options about the ombudsman or, you know, a manager to, to guide the process to help get through quicker. I think that's an excellent idea. And, and I've already told you in private meetings that we had to do something similar uh, probably about 2009 with the, the construction program at OCPS to, to deliver more schools quickly and on time. And so I would support all three, and thank you for this work on, on, on trying to streamline the process to get more housing on the market. Commissioner Wilson. Thank you so much. I appreciate the work that's gone into this. I know it's like this big conversation about housing and that it sort of needed to be honed in on in separate um, instances. And so this one, I think, is, is different from the others. I, I was very excited, I think, when we were talking about the missing middle and opportunities for the missing middle. I have concerns. Um, I am in that area of Horizon West where sometimes um, residents do become alert to a waiver and then mysteriously it goes away because somebody <laughs> Somebody realized that it's Horizon West, and they don't have to put that in the yeah. staff report. And, and then they want to know why they don't have a requirement for a setback for, that would provide a buffer between single family and multifamily. And so, you know, there's some friction there. And I, and I think it's reasonable to have that, but, it, but I think it's something that, um, depending on the case, depending on, on the project, it's still very appropriate, right, to make sure that these aren't being held up. And I think, um, it, in an area where we have some very high end, all luxury, nothing in the attainable, nothing in the affordable, on single roads, single lane roads that aren't in the pipeline for another 10 years, it's hard for me to give an accelerator push. I have, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like that wasn't the intent of this board. The board does want to increase inventory, but I think to do it in a place where there's established infrastructure or the, um, the ability to provide the services necessary for an urbanized area is important, right? So one size fits all in this fast track or this, I don't want to use the word fast track because I know that's got a very specific meaning here, but in this, um, this look at how to make things easier, um, I think for smaller projects, those missing middle projects, yes, let's do it. Let's, let's you know, put those in the, in, you know, let's incentivize the ones that look like they're redeveloping a, a blighted area. Yes, let's put those in the fast. Um, ones that have price inventory or that provide services within within the structure, right? Where we've got something of a, of a mixed use. But the I get 
really, really, really um, manipulated in my area on one side by developers who have no interest in anything but really high-end profit margins in areas where we literally have dirt roads. Um, by, they say, but we need more housing, we need more housing, we need more housing. And I understand that it's an overall inventory issue as far as the supply and demand. But I also think we have an obligation to look at the overall quality of life. And what that means is that if we provide sort of a blanket speed up for some of these, um, that we're gonna see it in places that have the largest profit margin. And that's gonna continue to add to sprawl and to some extent um, burdening areas that aren't ready yet, that don't have the infrastructure yet. Um, so, so I'm a little concerned, um, but I wanna hear what the rest of the board has to say. I just wanted to make sure I articulated the experience I'm having out in the West. Commissioner Uribe. All right, good afternoon. Alan, I, I have shared, I think I'm a little take, different take on this because I have been in development right. for 20 years. I come from that background. And I gotta tell you, um, when we do those waivers, they're self-imposed. When somebody applies and they know you need a 10-foot setback and they submit plans with a five-foot setback, we didn't change the rules. They changed their ability of what they can build. And I think um, that it's wrong. I'm also gonna go, I have been reviewing a lot of DRC. Why are planners interrupting with code and zoning? I have talked to developers who don't feel comfortable coming public, who have spent thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars because they built a code and the planner says, no, I wanna see this. And so they leave and spend $80,000 on new drawings, wait, come back to DRC, and zoning says, this isn't compliant. Mm. You need a waiver. Okay, so I don't want to call anyone out, mm -hmm. but if we don't have consistency on the county side, I actually think it's bad for us as commissioners as we are elected to oversee to now pass this on totally to staff and not be involved. And this is one of the reasons why I'm concerned with Vision 2050. You can't change the rules once you start playing. And that's the biggest problem I have. And, and Nick, you actually said it. Planners decided they wanted to move this closer to the road. Not zoning, not code, not public works, the planner. The planner's not the engineer on the project. The planner hasn't set the plans. We have very set plans that are established in the county. And it says 20 feet from the road. And the planner comes in and says, well, I think it should be 15. Now that, th that developer has to go redo their plans, come back, and request a waiver for something that we asked them to do. That's completely backwards. And when you're self, and, and then I'm gonna go to those internal buildings, which everything is not black and white in this, unfortunately. And I can't sit here and say, it's black and white for her or it's black and white for me. Um, you know, there are circumstances that are pre-existing, like that split you showed of those fast food. I mean, that's, that's not the norm. Um, internally in an apartment complex, that's internal. It doesn't really affect the general public. But these waivers that a lot of times, I, well, I've seen them, I want a five foot instead of 10 foot. They were told to do it that way. And then they were told, he, they did it in compliance, they updated their architectural plans and engineering plans, spent $100,000, and then have to now extend it three, four, five months because they have to come here to get permission for what the county planner told them to go do. That's the issue. And you know what, that cost goes on to the consumer. There is no developer in town that's gonna eat up $100,000, that's gonna eat up $80,000 and not pursue it to the consumer. So I'm sorry, and what we're essentially doing is taking away our rights as commissioners and giving it to staff now, but staff is also part of the problem imposing these. Not saying all staff, but like when you've got planning, they're not engineers. Planners are not engineers, and what they're imposing is ridiculous, and this is what's causing the problem. And I've had developers tell me who said, I'm going against DRC and I'm coming in front of the county commission because I can't afford this any longer, okay? So we have to talk about the reality of what's going on. And I just took notes by what you guys have said. Alan, I've shared a lot of my concerns, but, um, but you know, where are we at? Planners versus owners. Who's gonna take the upper card? Who eventually has a say-so to say what's gonna be legitimate or what's gonna be what is not? Because I don't, 
you know, a lot of times we have people who come and apply and they go through permitting and they say, okay, you guys have set out, here's the rules. You need so many setbacks, you need this, you need that. Now, when that applicant decides they want to change it for their self or, heaven forbid, a planner now comes in and says, I think you should change it, that's ridiculous. We're causing the problem. We're imposing it. We wouldn't see as many of these little cases if we internally had not said it on the applicant. So I, I'm going to have to disagree with this because, and I've just been looking at DRC cases on my own quietly because I'm seeing a trend, and I've gotten complaints of this trend. And it makes sense. I've got a case right now. Yes, you are short-staffed. Your team is trying to do the best they can, and it is tough. And I've told you, I've tried to call, and I can't get a hold of anybody. I finally went downstairs. But, but I, I am very nervous of this because we won't see when that happens. You're, you're missing that dialogue of we're causing the problem to the applicant. So if we could get our rules straight, I think we would streamline by itself. Unfortunately, what you have in Horizon West was kind of set and done because you were all newly developed. But I'm sorry, I don't support this because we're causing the problem. We aren't the problem now. We're causing the problem in the process. Because if somebody comes in and you tell them the rules and they're in compliance with zoning and public works, but a planner comes in and gives his artistic opinion that he doesn't want it, and now he has a problem and we have just cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars because we said it. And so I don't agree. I don't agree. I think we need to internally, we all have to be on the same page. If we've set rules and that applicant applies under those rules, no one in this county should be able to come in and say, I don't like it, change it. And we know it happens a lot because I've heard it. We have one coming up this afternoon where the planners made him change a ton of stuff. And he did, and now he doesn't understand why he's having problems in front of us. So I don't agree. We have to set a rule, and I think if we set a rule and we're consistent with that rule and we don't change the rule in DRC, then you will have a streamlining process. We won't see those cases. And then again, when it comes to internal stuff, I think that's, that's peanuts compared to what we're talking about. But you're right. We see waivers because we have imposed that on them because that applicant applied the right way, and we've caused the problem. Not the applicant, not your staff, our process of what we're expecting out of them. Thanks, Commissioner. All right. Um, I don't know who the appropriate person is to respond to that, but you know, I'm, I just want to know the reality. How often does that happen? Because it's, there's usually two sides to every story, and uh, so I just I want to know what's, what, what do the numbers bear out in terms of how often planners, if you will, are directing uh, or suggesting to developers that they should uh, change their plans slightly different from, from code. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Uh, Mayor, um, I think certainly the point that Commissioner Yeruby is making is a fair one, um, that there are instances where a project comes in and from a design standpoint, it may meet code, but there may be uh, things that uh, staff may be encouraging them to do uh, to modify the project uh, to otherwise create a better urban form. Um, sometimes that feedback is received well uh, by the development team. Other times that feedback is they've, they've already sort of set the path for the project and they're insistent or adamant on moving forward under the code. Um, and so the, 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 the discussions that occur between staff and the applicant team, uh, certainly it's our expectation that we advance projects consistent with code. Um, and so that's a conversation that uh, we've actually got scheduled um, with both DRC and uh, several of the managers and reviewers is to make sure that review philosophy and expectations are set clearly uh, to the team. Again, I think uh, most of the applicant team, applicants would acknowledge that some of that back and forth, especially if we have the ability to have influence on that project early on, can be beneficial to the overall project design. But I do expect, and I think certainly our management team would largely agree, that we expect our, our staff to review projects consistent with code. And if a project meets code, then we advance it through the process. And so those are th the conversations that were not perfect. But uh, again, I think most of the waivers that you see come forward are simply because of an outdated 60-year-old code, not because staff has encouraged a project uh, to be redesigned to be inconsistent with code. I'm not going to say it's never happened, but because it, it has. Um, okay. But you know, again, I think a lot of it has to do, and a lot of at least with option two, is an old, outdated code. 
Um, and again, part of that through Vision 2050, through uh, the Orange Code, I, th I think we're attempting to modernize the code, uh, create a lot more flexibility uh, with predictability at the same time. But uh, we are um, recalibrating uh, and, and discussing among DRC members sort of that review and, and, and philosophy with respect to projects and making sure that we're advancing projects, um, you know, again, consistent with the codes and policies and regulations that this board has set forth. Okay. Um, I still don't know if I understand how often this is happening. You know, this, it, <laughs> what, what has been kind of portrayed is that it, it, it sounds like this is something that happens uh, where a developer goes through and there's a, a suggestion by staff that this is something that happens routinely. Uh, and I'm just trying to understand the, the perspective from, from both sides here. I can't say for sure exactly how often that it happens, um, you know, and, and I, I do hear complaints and I'm sure, you know, some of the commissioners, you hear complaints about the uh, efficiencies through the DRC review process as well. Um, that's something I'm trying to get a better handle on exactly where uh, those pitfalls are occurring and working with the team members appropriately to identify that. Again, I think with, with option two, and again, if there's no interest among the board members to provide that. Uh, streamlining opportunity, it, staff certainly can take that direction. But again, I think that most of the waivers that make it to you are not the result of staff uh, trying to redirect or redesign a project. Most of them are simply uh, outdated provisions of code that simply don't work with what the developer is trying to accomplish. Okay. Uh, well, we'll be looking at code as well. All right. All right. Uh, Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Thank you. Um, John, don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> And thank you, Alan and Nick, for the presentation. And I, my question was very simple, but it got complicated. <laughs> well, not complicated, but went more straight to the point. But um, I just wanted to, now that you said about the outdating um, wave, you know, waivers and codes and so, do we have, that's why we are, we have flexibility in our waivers? So, again, what uh, Mr. Thalmuller mentioned was that every waiver under code today requires that to come to the Board of County Commissioners, no matter whether it's a, a technical waiver or of, of that's internal to the project or has a, is a major waiver that might have a significant impact to, you know, potentially adjacent communities. So, um, again, what we've identified with option two was an initial palette of uh, code sections and, and performance standards that might be subject to some uh, delegation or discretion to staff. Again, um, if there's not interest among the board in providing that additional flexibility, we understand that and certainly can continue to work with the policy direction uh, from, from all of you. I think option one and three uh, were uh, ones that I think coming into this conversation today, we were more hopeful uh, that there may be some opportunities to advance that again with option one. It's a largely uh, a process that already exists, works in, in Horizon West, and still uh, those projects would still come to the board. Those waiver requests would still come before you. And then option three, and certainly 50 acres is a big number, um, but, but you know, 10 is a pretty small number. And so maybe, again, I think what we try to identify, at least with option three, was looking at the data, uh, looking at the um, sort of the, the size of a you know, typical project, multifamily, 250 to 350 units, um, again, whether it occurs on 10 acres, 12 acres, 20 acres, um, is there a, 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 some a sort of bump that we could provide, again, looking to save some time for specifically multifamily housing? So, um, thank you, John. But saying that, just, you know, want to uh, give a recommendation just to alleviate all these things happening also as well, is that I think that internally we have to communicate to each other because it seems like one doesn't communicate to the other and then to the other, and then they change this one, and this one said, no, go back this, and then do this, and that's how, you know, and it's because it's coming to our office. I mean, the phone calls come. We, we meet with the developers. So I think it's important also to give that touch of communication between us so that way, you know, I mean, among you all, you know, right. and then it comes to us, um, you know, more linear. Thank you. And, and Commissioner, the project manager proposal um, that is being implemented will definitely facilitate the internal communication and help get projects unstuck. Um, so that's largely a, a role that we don't have being served today. And so certainly have been appreciative of the mayor and uh, Byron's support you know, to that end. John, also you may want to mention, though, that some of those dynamics of the discussion, be it planners, be it engineers, uh, is fairly typical in any review process in many organizations, many jurisdictions. Uh, some of it is about uh, just different elements, consideration of how do you make 
uh, projects uh, address some of the more uh, 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 features that are typically uh, desirable? Or how do you make uh, living space, how do you make spaces uh, more uh, compatible for, with people and some other activities? This is not uncommon where there is that, that um, discussion and give and take. Uh, clearly, though, if we have not been uh, conveying as much that it is uh, an option, a betterment of the project, then uh, certainly we are, and as John mentioned, that, that discussion is occurring. Uh, because sometimes those, those comments are welcomed. Uh, the developers, sometimes they save money uh, for the developers. Sometimes they're, they're welcome comments as well. Uh, but without a, no doubt, uh, it happens. And our uh, purpose, though, is to ensure that we aren't causing undue burden or delay on the project, and to the extent where our discussions now are, are uh, uh, within the DRC and, and uh, RCA and TRG, all our different processes, uh, that's our, our uh, responsibility to ensure that we are um, communicating. Uh, in today, it is code that we follow. Suggestions, comments, observations may be given. That's kind of the, the process, but I did want to just note that is a fairly common uh, type of, uh, of uh, uh, interaction in most development review processes in most jurisdictions. No, and I have to say, um, since it's still my turn, that I have to say thank you to you all. I mean, Nick, John, all of you have been very, you know, when I, don't, when I have a question that I say, well, what's going on here? I don't know. You've always been accessible to me and, you know, explain to me in, a, in the way that, you know, I can see it better. So thank you so much as well. Commissioner Bonilla. Yeah, well, a lot has definitely been said. Um, I'll say that, you know, I strongly agree with Commissioner Wilson and her concerns about, you know, the streamlining. And if we streamline just across the board, we're not really focusing on where we really need to streamline and what type of developments we really need to streamline. So I agree and have that same concerns as well. Um, and I also highly agree with Commissioner Uribe, you know, with her statements on that. Well, okay, so we have different issues, I think, everywhere in this whole process. I don't want to put all the blame just on staff. I don't want to put all the blame just on developers or on us. You know, it's, I think there's just everywhere there's issues that we're having. And, you know, I've, six years now being here at the county, um, you know, there's management of SEDS, you know, and now I'm seeing after six years something's being done to work on that management. Here at the board, we're the commissioners, we set policy. But then staff, you all have the flexibility on managing your teams and your departments, your divisions in the best and most efficient way to execute those policies. So we have our role here, and then you have your role. So I think there's things missing in your role in the management of the whole department um, that needs to be more efficient. Um, the, the way you work together, really the communication, um, the silos, all of that, that's all on you all that you need to fix and work on. The problem we're having right now is that 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 needs all that work is affecting us here and affecting the developers. And where we could work on that is our communications with the developers too. I think there really has to be like a pre-application community meeting, you know, so the developers understand the commissioner. So in my district, I do have those meetings with developers. They come to me, they speak to me before they go and purchase or put a contract on a piece of property so that they understand what I want. And staff, I mean, I've been really happy with the planners myself, because they, but maybe it took six years to get there, but they understand what I want. And so when they're talking to a developer, they're already working with them, understanding what I want and working with developer to get what they know I'm gonna ask for. And so they've definitely made my life a lot easier, <laughs> you know, in doing that. And so, like, I, I don't, and maybe it took six years to get there, but I'm not having a lot of issues. 
Uh, but I think it's because I have that communication with the developers, I have that communication with the staff, and they understand me, the developers understand me, and we're working really good together. And you know, Commissioner um, Gomez Cordero mentioned communication, and I got to that point because of communication. You know, and I think communication is very important in making sure that we get to a place where it could be more efficient for the developers, but we need the department to be more efficient. We need that communication. That constant communication makes things more efficient because there's no confusion. When you get confusion in the process, it's less efficient. When you're communicating, everyone understands each other, it's more efficient. So communication is very important. Another thing is that there needs to be a respect for the commissioners and what they want. And I say this respect from both staff and the developers. And so, you know, again, maybe it took six years to get here, but I, I have that with the planners. Like, they work really well. Like I said, they understand what I want, they respect what I want, and they work with what I want. The developers, same thing. And that's a respect. You know, when we're working together in line, they respect what I want. They, they respect what I'm asking for instead of fighting with me. Because if then if, you know, if, if I have a developer who's like fighting against what I want and is not respecting that, and what I want is what the people want. So it's not about really what I want, it's about what the people want. So if they're fighting against that, this whole process is going to be delayed, delayed, delayed because they're fighting against but if they work together with us, that process goes by so much faster. So it's, you know, it's all of us working together, having that respect. And you know, the developers, like I said, you know, they've, they've met with me, they talk with me, they try to understand what I want. Um, so having that maybe get to know meetings with you know, the developers, and you know, they came to me. I didn't go seek them out to do that. Um, they came to me, they wanted to get to know me, get to know what I want, get to know what my communities want, you know, and just that relationship and that respect really helps things move along faster. When there's conflict and people aren't working together, people not communicating, and people are not respecting each other, that's when we have issues. So we really need to work on the culture of the county, making sure that we have that, making sure that we're working on processes on your end, not on our end. Like, you know, our processes are the policies. We set policy. But you really have the flexibility to make sure that the process is, you know, behind the door. I don't mean behind closed doors, but the, the bad way. I mean, like, you know, like back in your offices, you know, where all the magic happens. Um, that's, you have control over that and how that works. And you need to work on that and make sure it's as efficient as possible and that it works with us, and we're all on the same team here. We need to work together and respect each other and communicate with each other. And I think that will solve a lot of our problems. So I am for no changes to current process until we work on all this that we have right now that we need to work on. And I feel that by doing that, a lot of this would move a lot faster. All right, so um, from a staff perspective, you kind of heard the dialogue this afternoon. Um, not sure that it was it was clear. <laughs> well, Mayor, uh, I, I think we're I think we're hearing that there's a significant amount of concern with option two, just a, as a whole, um, and there could be further discussion on that. Uh, option one and option three essentially are uh, cutting out a, a process loop. It's not, it's not necessarily a, a difference in the body that makes the decision. Uh, so I'm just trying to make a difference between, like Commissioner, so, Commissioner Wilson so brought let up let just, a context. Let me try to jump in. Um, in terms of the option one, <clears throat> is there any uh, desire by the board uh, to make some uh, consideration for option one. No, I agree. Yes. no, I just feel like we need to see what we could work on now before we okay. try anything new. All right, uh, option two. No. no. Okay. No. And option three. No. Okay. Okay. So 
Well, at least right now, um, it appears that on options one and two, the significant concern there. Option three, I'm hearing, uh, need a little bit more input. I do think that there's some vulnerability with option three uh, because uh, what I heard you say is that we're an outlier from the rest of the state. And uh, the state has already you know, passed some legislation in this regard. And uh, if we're not careful, uh, what we will see is some preemption there. So I do think that there's probably an opportunity there if it is not of uh, the 50 acres or, or what have you. Or what I'd like you all to do is visit back with the commissioners, get some input to see if there's some flexibility there somewhere. Uh, but I believe that if we're not careful, uh, we're very, very vulnerable there uh, in that regard. So uh, with that, that's the feedback well, out. I yeah, would. on number three, I would like to make some comments. I'm sure Wilson wants to make, I'm not sure if it's the same topic. But, I mean, that large, you know, more than 10 acres really affects more of the rural districts. And those are of large impact. So, so let, let, let's so staff need, just visit with you and kind of kind of work through that. I don't. I think trying to do it here today, I don't, I don't think we can get there uh, in terms of time. But let, let them visit with you. Uh, I think they uh, have done some research. They can provide you with some update and, and get your input and give you some input on that as well. Um, Commissioner Wilson. I'm sorry, just really quickly, because you know, obviously, under the first bullet point, there were the three options. The proceeding with limited streamlining amendments, I think that's where it sounds like this next part will go, right? So that we can kind of identify where I think we are seeing opportunities above and beyond some of the things we, I think we're hearing that we're maybe, we all thought we were having our own individual frustrations, but it sounds like maybe these are things that we can get to. So I, I see it as a positive, and I think those are two separate potential conversations hopefully we can have. Um, I wanted to, um, agree with you, Commissioner Bonilla, about the, the communication, the respect, or, you know, and also, actually all of you guys, it was a really good discussion, but, you know, my office is, it, District 1, you guys see it in the afternoons, right? A lot of times we have like 16 out of the 21 cases, and community meetings are, are something that I, when I came into office, it was really a, a high priority for me to, to do those, those as part of the process. They're part of our development process, you know, as articulated, and we've been, like recently pressured into either skipping them or providing them virtually or because, you know, someone's having to wait for a date when I've got three sometimes in a week and these are evening. I have staff there until 9 o'clock at night. And, you know, we're the only ones that really even broadcast that. There's no communications arm that sends that out after a, a meeting to the rest of the community. So there's so many opportunities, I think, to really get community feedback where we don't end up here on a Tuesday until two o'clock in the morning over something controversial, that I'm like, we should have worked this out before this ever got to step one in this process, and we could have done it. But sometimes I think that, you know, things are done a certain way for so long that they just continue to do that until, as a board that looks like we're moving in the same direction, the right direction, we say, okay, let's try to do this differently. And I think having identified projects that clearly do need streamlining is one part of it, but I also think having that, what you know, you were describing, Commissioner Benia, as that communication with the development team, planner, and all the, of the above early on in the community, so that we don't end up, you know, two years in, a hundred thousand dollars later, being the bad guy. Okay, you it. all got it. That was it. <laughs> okay, all right. So with that, um, and that's the balance of the morning's agenda. We're going to break until we're going to recess until 2 o'clock, and we'll reconvene at 2 p.m. for the afternoon portion of the board. To staff, uh, thank you all for your diligence in your presentation, and to those uh, from the community who may have been uh, watching and listening, uh, thank you as well. <laughs>